peux euh, repasser un coup à la Let's, let's restart. It will uh, help the, the last one to, to, to join. Um, so, as an introduction of the, of the session of, the, of this afternoon, um, I think that for all of you, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's already good to, to go digital, to, to digitally transform your, your, your city. It's even better to, to make the web see it and, uh, and to, to you have the biggest, the largest uh, digital footprint uh, for, for, for your city. And that's exactly what uh, Omar will, uh, will explain you. What is the digital footprint of your city? And give you some tips and tricks on how to, uh, to, to improve it and to be more visible uh, on the web, on the relevant topics, uh, topics that are relevant for your digital transformation strategy. Omar? but also your cities. We have a website, a social media, to make an impact. So you can look to cities in the same way I'm looking to fast-growing companies. And looking to digital footprints, I think the first question to ask is, why is it important? I mean, why do we focus on having digital footprint? And why do we invest money and energy in doing that? Till today, I think the key words here is, It's a bit strange on my screen, but that's okay. Um, it's about capturing value. You all, as a city, are investing to attract investors, companies, uh, talent, maybe citizen, maybe anything you want to do. So you have a message to give to the outside world. And to do that, you want to make sure that you want to capture that value. You do that by ensuring you have um, a certain reach, reaching people what your message, what you're doing as a city. <coughs> also, doesn't really work actually, but that's okay. Um, also, it's about making sure that your brand is known. A city also has a brand, a certain name, a, a reputation, an authority. Um, it's one of the best ways to go international, because if you want to catch attention from outside, in digital way, it's very simple. I mean, if you want to get your known to China, you have to organize a mission to get there, maybe to advertise. But in the online world, there's no borders. Anyone who has internet connection, anyone with a smartphone can find about your city. It's a very simple and cheap way to get international attention. In the middle, which is hard to see, it says a turn on X, a turn on investment. You're investing in what you're doing as a city, infrastructure, universities, and schools. Or it might be something else, a turn on social impact. It doesn't always have to be about money, right? The benchmark I took are the four mentor cities we have in this project. That should be. Um, the left hand side, Amsterdam in the Netherlands, Espo in Finland, we also have Hamburg in Germany, and last we have the city of Nice in France. These are the four mentor cities, so I've compared them and also make some, some conclusions. Uh, interesting, all of them are um, government initiatives from the city, except Hamburg, it's a uh, private public collaboration. So it's a commercial company working together with the city to make a portal. Uh, the one in Hamburg. You can see in the impact as well in the numbers. Now, the first thing that I measured is what we call Google PageRank. Um, it's an algorithm from Google. 
between 0 and 100. It tells you where you are if you search on Google for certain information. So I'm looking for information about the city. This shows you if you are very high, top 10, or you are very low there. There is a saying, a proverb, that tells you the best place to hide a dead body is page to Google. Nobody is watch over there. So you better want to be on the first page. And that number, the page rank, helps you to know where you are. If you compare the page rank to the four cities, you will see that the highest score is 100. They have 83, it's very high. It's like uh, the website of CNN.com, so very high page rank. If you look for Hamburg, they will pop up very high. Um, number two will be Amsterdam, city of Amsterdam, then Espo, and lastly, the city of Nice um, in France. The average is 57. Again, it's a good score for a city website, um, in my opinion. Looking to wave one cities, the average is 28, significantly lower. Um, and the best in class in that group is um, Thessaloniki. Look to wave two, average is 36, a bit higher. Best in class are two cities, Pori in Finland, Rekia, um, Rijeka in, uh, in Croatia. One of the parameters influencing that is the age of your website, the older the better. So if you're an early adopter, it's like social capital that you're building over time. You can see Amsterdam was very early, 1994 already, <coughs> and they've been out there uh, digitally. Other cities followed about um, 15, 20 years ago. Um, for your information, in wave one, there is still one city with no website. I'm not telling you the name, but there's still one city there, um, which is surprising in 2019, <coughs> but it's possible. The person left, so it's okay. <laughs> I took a flight this morning, so I don't have to embarrass anyone here. Um, other parameter, interesting enough, in my opinion, is um, what we call backlinks. What is a backlink? It's very simple. It's an other website linking to your site. So your site is in the middle. That's the website of your, your initiative for your city. Other websites setting a link to you, so what we call a backlink. Why is it important? It's a proxy for your <coughs> stakeholders, because if I link to your website, it means we have a relationship somehow. I'm a partner, I'm a supplier, uh, I'm a citizen maybe, I'm an initiative in the city, um, and can be anything can be uh, this mission here, and if this project is linking back to your city, that's also a backlink. So by analyzing the backlinks, I have a proxy for your stakeholders. <coughs> it's also a very good proxy for your ecosystem. So your ecosystem can be measured, digital speaking, using backlinks, which is very, very powerful. If you look to the backlinks for these four cities, you can see the number of backlinks. Uh, green means best in class, red means uh, worst in class, is top four. That Hamburg has the most extensive ecosystem out there. A lot of stakeholders are linking to the city or the portal, the city of Hamburg. Um, compared, for instance, Amsterdam, which is much lower than that. Um, to give you a feeling, if you put the number down, referring domains, 29,198 other websites linking to 100. I mean, that's huge. Eh? That's a lot of websites that go back to um, the city of 100. If you put it over time, you can see that since 2004, so about 10 years ago, you see the orange line is 100. It's by far the biggest. Then we have Amsterdam, followed by um, Espo and Nice. But the difference is huge. As a general rule, if it's 10 times bigger, it's very hard to compete. So in this case, Hamburg is a champion to look in terms of backlinks. But of course, it's also interesting to see if it's growing or going down. If I take one city of these four, city of um, Espo, you see that uh, City Festo has a very nice growth uh, up to about 14 months ago. So I like the growth, you can see it steady from 2004 until now. But the last 12 to 14 months, they lost about 500 stakeholders. If I am a city, I'd like to know why is someone disconnecting from me? What happened? That's a lot of stakeholders you're losing for a small city. So going down is something if I was City of Espo and everybody else here, to try to understand why is my ecosystem shrinking 
it's not healthy. Again, so many years of healthy growth, and at some point you see this, you better pay attention. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the rest is here. <laughs> More to come about Espo. More to come about Espo soon. Nice is also in the room, so careful what you say. Yeah? <laughs> it's a special case, you will see. Okay, I, I better stop for, for my own safety. <laughs> um, and Amsterdam has cancelled just before the seminar because oh, oh, they can be new. Really harsh. Um, <laughs> um, now the third parameter is uh, global ranking. Uh, why do you rank globally? in terms of visits to your website. There are 1.4 billion websites out there. That's a lot of websites. To be there in the top is quite challenging. And you can see that, um, for instance, Hamburg in the world has 18,000 most visited websites out there. Who's number one? Any idea who should be number one? Sorry? Not a city, just the most visited website in the world. Facebook or Google? Yeah, it's Facebook or Google. Right? That's number one. And then two, three, four. In that ranking, 18,000, it's to me impressive for the city. It's a good performance. Actually, three out of the four, all of them except the city of Nice, I'm sorry for that, is a top 100,000. For a city, I am pretty impressed actually. If you look to BF2, a BF1, no, uh, Alain doesn't understand what, what the ranking is. No, no, I think that's... Uh, ranking means, um, so the number one, number one in that ranking has the most visits on the website in the whole world. Okay. Number two is the second most ranked. So in this, Hamburg is the 18th most ranked, which is quite an achievement. So the lower the number, the better. That's why it's green for Hamburg and red for city of Nice. If you look to um, wave one, it's about half a million. And this is a power law. It goes very quickly down. Eh? That's quite normal. Sofia, is Sofia here? Yes. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Best in class in wave one. Um, wave two, um, again, it goes quickly. It goes to the top one million. It's still an achievement. Eh? They're 1.4 billion. It's still an achievement. But you can see that there's some improvement. Best in class is Pori. Is Pori here today? Yes, yes. There you go. Well done. If you look to the number of visitors, estimated traffic, um, your own tool should tell you more detail, but this gives you a good estimation based on two different um, uh, tools I'm using for that. Um, Hamburg has per month more than 3 million visitors, that's a lot, but it's also very content oriented. Uh, others like Amsterdam are 1.5, again, it's a lot uh, as such. Goes down, it's a power line, so from uh, 3 to 50% to 1.5. Two times smaller, you go to Espo half a million, and then again it halves to Nice. So you can see the power law. It means the best of you will take proportionally a very big share of attention, right? It's not like nicely linear, it goes very quickly. So you better are a champion, and you have the first winner, that's the best one, and you have the first loser, second loser, third loser, just to scare you. But my point is you better are in the top, because attention goes to a very small group of cities in the world. Other parameters here give you a feeling about the quality. Um, and you can see ESPO being... Um, is, is ESPO here today? No? ESPO? ESPO, yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, you should pay attention. Um, ESPO has a very high quality of audience. I think their citizens are quite digital. How do I know? You don't have the biggest traffic like we have in Hamburg. But like I said, it's very commercial there. But ESPO is managing to get the right people. You can see it in the consumption, how many pages and time, but also the abandoned rate, the last line, the bounce rate. What does it mean? People coming to your website and leaving without doing anything else. No, you go to the website, you click on things, you scroll, you do some action, right? But if you have 34%, you have a very sticky visitors. It, this means it's the right visitors for you. Again, if you take uh, Nice, which has 56, it's still acceptable, right? It's not like a very high, big, uh, ugly number. It can go up to 70, 80 percent sometimes. So all of are doing very well. But the best focus digital citizens are to be found in ESPO based on this proxy. 
I was interested in how many of your visits coming from your own country, not the same city, but the same country. You can see that uh, in Nice, in France, it's 87%, it's the lowest, so 30% are outside France, while in Estrue it's only 1%. So if you want to be more international, that number has to change. If not, then it's okay, of course. Where are they coming from? If you look to uh, Amsterdam, it makes sense because the countries of the Netherlands are Belgium and Germany. These are neighbor countries, uh, often speak the same language or similar. If you look to Tunis, it's um, France, UK, and Monaco. OK, it makes also sense. Hamburg is Germany, and then you have Switzerland and Austria. Makes sense, language, proximity, as such. Espo doesn't get the right picture because it's only 1%, so it doesn't really tell you what's happening there, 1% divided by the number of countries. It's a bit um, a biased view, eh? so you can ignore the US uh, in France. It's too small as a sample size. Also interesting is where is traffic coming from? So there are different sources. Um, the first one is direct. It means somebody is typing in the website of your city or has it in favor, please stand and clicks on that. And you can see there, ESPO again shows that citizens go there very conscious. They know they have to go there, so they are very digital oriented. They open the websites. While everyone else is much more depending on search. You type in Amsterdam City, but then maybe in Dutch, and you find them. So search number three is, can mean that people don't know where to go, or it's a very complex name. If you have a very long city name, sometimes it's easier to type in Google than to type in the website, of course. But again, here it shows ESPO is doing very well in terms of having citizens know where they need to go. In terms of social media, you can see Amsterdam has almost 5% from social media, which means best in class, you want to learn, it's Amsterdam in terms of social media. Also, in terms of emailing, sending emails with a, with a link back to your website, you can take some lessons from ESPO, because they have the highest traffic coming from their newsletters, sending emails to their citizens or community or stakeholders. Advertising, not everyone is doing that. The first means coming from other websites uh, to your, um, to your um, website. There, Amsterdam is also leading with 5.3%. If you look to um, the trends, uh, if you go to trends.google.com, you can find the trends over time for your own um, city. Maybe it's better to show it over time in this way. You can see here Amsterdam, although it slows down, it's stable for the last 10 years. That's 2004 until now, so that's quite a normal thing. If you look to Hamburg, that's not so good. It goes down over time, slowly going down. That's not a good sign. It means you're losing popularity in rich um, search engines. In this case, uh, Google, which is important in Europe. If you look to ESPO, it's a bit stable, but you see ESPO is another thing. You can see clearly every season coming back, so they have some, some peaks, people in certain seasons want to go more to Espo, looking about Espo uh, in Finland. The majority is uh, traffic from, uh, from Finland. Also interesting is, what are the seasons? How come? Can we make it stronger? Can we play with that? As such. Last one is the city of Nice. Um, special case. You can see here, huge 2016. Any idea why? Terrorism. Yes, terrorism. So terrorism 2016 made a huge peak in searching for the, the portal of the city of Nice to get, get information what's happening in, uh, in Nice. But other than that, it looks quite stable over the years. Interesting, if you would monetize your, uh, your traffic, you put in Google AdWords or some other advertisements, how much is the value of your website and your portal? You can see that Hamburg, being the most commercial one uh, already, it's 2.3 million, that's a lot of money. So you can do something with that, uh, right? To improve um, your digital team. Uh, compared to Amsterdam, 250,000 uh, euros, and the rest is also smaller. If you look to wave one, the number goes down to around 10,000, 11,000 in average. Uh, best in class is Sofia, also in this case. Wave two, it again goes down to about $4,000 um, in value you can get if you would do that uh, as such. Best in class is Pori in um, Then we have the site score, it's a number between 0 and 100. 100 means uh, you're perfect, um, you're perfect, your website is made technical marketing speaking to be found by search engines. So you make sure everything is filled in, the character language, every picture has a name or an attribute, 
you don't use underscores, all these small details to make you better can be measured here. Um, to me, this is all a very high score. Anyone who has 75% or more is doing very well. So I was quite surprised that technical marketing skills of cities, the top four, right, the mentor cities, are actually very good. Their team, they understand digital, at least from that point of view. So that was quite impressive. 85 is very, very high. So I'm suddenly doing something very good. You can see drops of 63% in DF1. Basic class, Granada. Anyone from Granada here? No? Ah, there you go. Okay, well done to you. Um, we have two, quite similar, 60%. Again, Croatia is, uh, is leading there. This can be fixed very quickly. So it's not like a big issue. I think if you're scoring low there, there's something you can do. To give you an example, um, if you would Google the four cities, you will see these four previews. Look to um, up there in um, the city of Amsterdam. What you see is Gemeente Amsterdam, home, Gemeente Amsterdam. So, home, city of Amsterdam. Why would you put home there? You can remove home and just put there Gemeente Amsterdam as such. It will be enough. If you look below that the text, they explain, um, hard to read it from here, explain what you have with the official website of the city of Amsterdam. That's what we're doing. That's good. I like that. If you look to um, ESPO, there, it's the same. Espo.fe, uh, Finance, the same word as below. Why would you leave that? You can put there the official website, the official portal of, uh, you can use it as an opportunity for your marketing, right? So that's, to me, something you can improve. Look to Hamburg, I think the title is good, quite clear what it is all about. Although, even Hamburg.de, I will not repeat, it's just below, it. you can see the website. It would be enough to say Professor Stadt Portal for the Hamburg Hamburg Stadt Hamburg to be enough in our opinion. Um, and they also made a mistake. If you read the text below it, it will just stop all the behörde and it stops. Check, which is very bad. So you have to make it maximum 150 characters, I think. So if it's a bit shorter, it will be better. And lastly, um, <coughs> you have the city of, of um, Nice. I think in the title it's fine. Eh? It tells you it's about uh, the city. But below it, it just repeat the same text. It's a missed opportunity. So it's a good example here in terms of your marketing. If you're using five minutes of your time to improve that and make it best practice, right? Make description in a title. Use maximum 140 characters to tell you what it's all about. Don't repeat things like home or things like that. It will be very performant. So again, small changes can have a big impact as such. By the way, if the text is too long, like in Hamburg, you get negative points from Google, from Bing, from Yahoo, which is harder to get on top of quickly. Next to that, uh, look at the speed. Um, speed from a website or a mobile. These days, mobile becomes very important. If you're not good in that, you get penalty uh, from the search engines. Um, look to Amsterdam. The speed at desktop is extremely high. So the faster the website opens, the better. Um, mobile, I would say, can be improved, but it's still best in class. So the other cities, I will not name them, can also improve their um, significant. If you look to um, how many domains they're managing, you can see some of them go very broad, different domains, some of them into only one domain, that's a personal choice, um, although I think there's some best practices there. And last is all the languages, you can see that uh, Amsterdam Hamburg has two languages, i.e. Dutch or German and English. Uh, if you look to uh, ESPO, I think it's Finnish, Swedish and English, I believe. If you look to um, Tunis, it's only one language France. It's a missed opportunity, in my opinion, to go broader than just one language. Um, good example here, again, is uh, Pori. Pori is not a language, but also they have um, made sure they have websites like Visit Pori is managed by them. So it's a smart way to position yourself. You have Pori for the citizens, you have Visit Pori to get attention from outside as well. So I think it's good practice. Also, if you open the website of Pori, you see here that it's focused for Pori citizens. It's about, um, um, it's about the family, about things that they have in mind. You see the picture in there. If you have the English version, it looks more tourist and business oriented. You see business services on the left hand. You see it's focusing on tourism and culture. So it's a smart way to play around with the same website but a different profile of visitors. I think it's uh, interesting to learn from it. What about your analytical skills? Um, 
There's a lot of things you can measure online, a lot of things. There are different domains you can measure. I made a list here, like performance monitoring, are you fast or slow? Um, heat mapping, can you really follow somebody's track? Uh, I mean, is he really clicking on things or not? All these things can be measured. There's a lot of things to be measured. What do you see? You measure mm, almost nothing. These are the best mental cities, and even there, everybody's doing analytics, but nothing more than that. The 2019, it's not good enough. If somebody enters your city digitally, you don't go, you don't ask what you want, you don't see where you're going, which streets you're taking, what kind of shops you want to see, you know nothing about them. You're blind, and that's a pity. So I think any city here can really improve using the right tools. Once again, I give you one best practice. It's the city of Poli, that's their tech stack to analyze. They're using Hotjar, heat mapping, using New Relic, performance management, using Polaro to get feedback from customers, using Golantics, which is free anyway, um, to get in view on the customers, that's not enough. They also have Matomo to measure what they're doing, and lastly using um, Drupal, European Content Management System open source, which also can appreciate being a European product. So that's an example that you can apply. I don't want you to have 20 tools. You don't have Rolls Royce when you're not having driving license. But to me, this is something you can really apply. So I think today, if there's one thing I can recommend to you, is try to improve the analytics that you understand, who's coming to you, what they're doing, why they're there, when they're leaving, what they're clicking or not, what they like or not. You can measure pretty much everything online. What about social media? It's quite clear that in general, if you look to the cloud score, I mean, the best influence is uh, the city of Nice in general, but in a number of areas like uh, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, you can see Amsterdam is doing very well. So you can look into Amsterdam or the city of Nice if you want to learn how to do that. Uh, if you look to citizen engagement, I like Amsterdam a lot. Um, if you look to how we did that, uh, a number of telephone, the way you can reach them, offline, online. Uh, also, on the right hand side down, we have uh, the WhatsApp, so you can have quickly um, feedback from um, from civil servants about any question you might have. If you go to English, you cannot have it there because uh, it's only for Dutch speakers, but I think it's very smart to go today and use new tools to engage with your citizens, not just by phone and in the office, but also in terms of new way to engage, which is um, WhatsApp. Interesting also is uh, your geographical footprint. Uh, Google is king in Europe and in the US. But if you want to go to Latin America, get attention, Yahoo is important there. If you want to be big in Japan, Go is the number one search engine in Japan. If you want to be known in Russia, you have to be known by Yandex. If you want to expand your, uh, your brand to China, you need to be on Baidu, so what you're under 60. So really it's important to be also in different search engines to be found in there. I think the city of Hamburg is doing extremely well, so it's one place you can look into to see how you can um, how you do it, what you can learn from them as such. Uh, to summarize, this exercise for the top four metro cities, but also for wave one and wave two, and any other city here I can do. If you want to know your own score, how you can improve it, you can see me in the next couple of hours. It will be a pleasure to give you feedback. I hope you get some guidance, I hope you get some new insights, I hope you also get a new perspective. Above all, I hope it inspire you to make it happen. Thank you so much. Questions to, to a mouth. Is this presentation disseminated? Yes. <laughs> so, what's the question? If you disseminate this uh, presentation? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. You get a copy of this in PDF um, as such, absolutely. Yeah. And just to, to complement, huh, because we, we are using, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, the services of Omar for in, in, case, in the context of a strategy to dividends, when a company or an investment fund want to buy another company to measure uh, the digital footprint of this company, which of course has a clear impact on the value of, uh, of the company. And that's typically the kind of analysis Omar can run for you, uh, and also to go, of course, deeper into the, the levers to improve uh, your digital uh, footprint. Uh, customized to your end goal. Huh? Uh, no, not every city needs to be visible from China, but uh, okay, maybe some of yours. Carlos and then Yang. Yes. I have a question regarding 
know, the extent to which you should be using these analytics to steer your development of your website and your communications and outreach. <coughs> if you take the doing business ranking from the World Bank, I've heard of cases of countries doing specific things to modify one of the, or two of the indicators that are going to allow them to move up in the rankings, but in the end it doesn't really change much about how easy it is to do business in the country. They're just doing it to modify the rankings. So to what extent should you be guiding your development strategic reflection based on this, or just using it as uh, a kind of secondary source of information to know how you're doing? Where would you situate, you know, yeah. where the cities should position themselves? The, the issue is not alone in the world. There are a lot of other cities uh, outside this group, right, doing um, very aggressive in what they're doing. So in that world, attention is disproportionately going to the city. So if you want to play a role in there, you need to be quite ambitious. You cannot be small. It goes really, really quickly, you go to a corner. That's not a good thing. Um, that's one, one thing, so you have to be competitive in my opinion. The other side is, I mean, all of you have a lot of value to offer. Uh, really, I was talking to a number of you, and you're a small city in the middle of nowhere, but it has something to offer, lifestyle, whatever. So that kind of value, the value you're offering, if you don't let it know to the outside world, it's a crime. I mean, you have something to offer, all of you have something unique, your own DNA. You don't want to be the other Silicon Valley, you don't want to be Hollywood, it's impossible. But you have to find your own DNA. That's one thing. And the other thing is, the world has to know about your DNA. What are you good in? I think it's your duty to let everybody know what you're really good in. So these are two things you have to take into account. Um, that was very helpful. Um, but I mean, of course, these are, I would say, horizontal metrics. Like, you know, it can be a city, it can be a company, it can be any website. Have you thought of, have you thought of getting a little deeper into the services provided by the cities. Uh, I think there can be an automated way for that. Yeah, it is, of course, automated. I was invited by Vivendi, um, by Sixteen and by Pierre from Berger to give this light view on things. When I do that for uh, companies, we take 150 parameters into account. We compare to the best in the world, which I didn't do. I didn't compare it to Hong Kong or Singapore or Dubai, maybe. So I really go, we really go much, much deeper to make a strategy based on that. Here I want to tease you, let you know, and give you an indication where you stand. But this is not the full thing, far from this. So, do you have a way to go into the question, what are the services provided by each city for you? I didn't analyze it in the case of this, uh, but you can. It's not just a question of yeah. work. Yeah. And sorry, just to, to compare the, the, the comments from Omar, I think making the list, as I must say, it's just a question of workload, no? and just to, to benchmark uh, all the different cities. But what's more interesting with this kind of tool is that then you can measure the performance of these comparable services across cities. Right? And not just say, OK, they, they, they're offering two more services than I do. Great, let's, let's just offer the, these two services. No, even within the same services, the different cities are offering. These ones are really used. These ones are really visible when some others are just unknown and unused by, by the citizens or by the companies and, and, and so forth. So that's, that's why it's really uh, quite useful. Daniela. Hi. Very, very interesting. I, I uh, started a you know, analytics company 23 years ago, so I'm, <coughs> I like what I see, but I. I would love it even more if um, we would be able to go in depth and look at that audience. So who exactly is interacting? Who are we reaching out to? Because I think that is where the fascinating thing comes. What type of customers? What are the segments? What is the characteristic behavior? And then we are, basically, if we can have a backbone of understanding the customer for each of these cities, then we probably have a benchmark ability. As it is, it's, it's very good for certain purposes, but I think what we are aiming with the TCC project is about reaching out to that, those particular communities, and each and any one of them are particular, are different. So have you ever considered using uh, one of these, say, um, um, well established consumer segmentations, which exist, I can give some names, but I would be friendly with this, uh, to um, 
analyze that, uh, to, 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 to cross-tabulate, basically, to understand the profiles of the people who are interacting with the various cities in digital. Uh, yes, if you apply that for commercial um, organization, look at the persona, so we go much more detail. But this is also why I recommend to this group, if you look to this slide here. <coughs> to really start measuring, because if you don't use this kind of tools, you will not know what kind of personas you have. Honestly, you don't know yourself. That's to me more worrying. I give you a micro view, but you should know your own uh, as such. So, to me, uh, and let me again repeat, you don't have to have all these tools. Eh? I mean, you're not Uber, you're not you're not Spotify. I understand, but this is to me sign that you don't know enough about your visit. People coming to your website or your portal, you don't know who they are, what they're doing, when they're leaving, why they're leaving, all the opportunities in there. And it shows here, but it's, uh, it's also small city, it's not, this is not like Hong Kong or whatever. It's poorly, to me, this is already good enough. They have a very good view, in my opinion, to understand the personas coming to the website, they, they measure their performance, they have a feedback loop, uh, so they have a heat map, to me, it's a good example of a stack for you to understand exactly the personas. Yes, may, I, may I just add, because I'm not talking about the persona, I'm talking about the actual data, the actual customer who is interacting. I'm really talking about uh, customer segmentation. There are worldwide customer segmentations, so we're using a, a similar language, a similar technology across countries, including China. Can you give an example? Can you give one yes. example? Yes, Mosaic from Experian in the UK. <coughs> but this is a persona. This is a persona. No, 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 it's a consumer segmentation. I'm sure as an academic, you have been using. But I think it's a question of, uh, of of language. To me, I call it a persona. Yeah. But this is not a persona. That is a marketing uh, you say the same language. Thing. language. I think it's the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, but I just want to repeat to you, if you don't use the tools, you will not know who's going to your website. That's the only point I want to make. Uh, another question. Because the cities want the practical information in order to uh, expand uh, their marketing capital in digital things, to marketing uh, companies responsible, if you would like to hire a company, you choose marketing companies or uh, ICT companies. This is the problem. Uh, what did you? Uh, it's called technical marketing. Eh? You need to have technical skills to do the marketing uh, these days. It's a good observation. But uh, once again, um, if you look to, um, it's not just a question of marketing. Uh, in my opinion, if you look to, Yeah. Um, there is a good point. If you want to reach the rest of the world, I agree you should look from a marketing point of view. And I think you should. But if you take Espo again, I you don't reach the world. 99% of the traffic is in, you know, lo not locally, it's in Finland. But what I like about Espo is they're reaching their citizens. I mean, they're very really digital citizens. They go to the right website. They have that, they have access, they stay in there, they have low abundance rates. So to me, marketing is one thing, but you as a city want to provide services used and consumed by your citizens. And that's to me the other side of the equation. Make sure you reach the right audience. So marketing, yes, but your citizens are also key. Maybe one, one, last, uh, one last question before we, we jump to the next uh, session. No? All clear? Ah, yeah. I have a question. Do you have uh, like a number for us how much um, the cities um, spend yearly for online marketing and just um, getting their content management system updated? It's a very good question. Um, no, I don't have a number um, as such, but I think you as a group can do peer right. exchange. Uh, you can see here the good, the bad, and the ugly, if I may say so. I think for you to uh, exchange on best practices and tell kind of budgets or headcount, we already help the group a lot in our opinion. One more comment. I think it would be very interesting to know, because you cannot answer that, but generally speaking, what type of uh, services are consumed on these websites? Yeah. So
so uh, okay, there are some so many visitors per month. Okay, what what do they do there? Do they just yeah. consume information? Do they, for example, Cabo may have a lot of online services that are used, whereas other uh, cities don't. So that yeah. all, all is always a lot. I agree, and that's why I stress again the articles here because this will allow you, like event management, one of them, the category event, is where you can really measure what is being consumed per loop. That's one example. If you don't tag it, you will not know. Okay, thank you very much, Omar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. public services via public-private partnerships and uh, for this reason we have with us Alain Chateau, he's from Nice, he's also director for the Smart City Excellence Center and uh, Alain, the floor is yours. Oh yes, or you don't care, man. Because you see there's this message on the You didn't try to open before? No. You didn't It's not a problem of your presentation. No, I don't think so. No, it's a no, problem no, no. of uh, the computer coming. Because the issue yes, because there was this uh, window which was uh, Yes, they be 
So ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. So um, I'm working for the what we call Center of Excellence for Smart City of the Metropole Miss Côte d'Azur. And just for your information, uh, the Metropole Miss Côte d'Azur is a cluster of 49 municipalities. And most of them are uh, small villages uh, in the countryside. And actually, I mean, 15% uh, of the of the this territory, uh, this metropole is uh, is uh, on the urban side, on the on the sea side, and uh, with 85% of the population and 85% of the of the territory is rural and mainly highland highlands. So it's a south of Hat. So which means that we have a, a territory which is very heterogeneous, and which means that when we talk about smart city, actually we need to talk about the smart territory because obviously. Uh, the digital uh, uh, transformation of this territory is not only urban, it's also rural. And we have to, to cope with both, I mean, uh, these, uh, both challenges. Um, before I enter in the, the details of the, the topic, I think it's important that we, I explain, I mean, where we are coming from, because uh, usually when we uh, adopt a strategy, it's of course based on our own, uh, I would say, heritage and where, uh, where we are, I mean, uh, and that's why it's important maybe just to give you a, a flavor of, of, of the, our, our journey, I mean, from the, uh, the origins. Uh, for more than a century, uh, the Nice, uh, located so on the Côte d'Azur, uh, 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 the economy of the Nice Côte d'Azur, I mean, was mainly based on tourism, and uh, which was a more or less a, a mono type of activity. And uh, about 10 years ago, uh, the, the new mayor, Christian Strozzi, which who is also our president of the metropole, uh, decided that, that for developing, I mean, the, uh, the territory and uh, the economic development of the territory, it would be necessary uh, to address the diversification of this economy. But because, I mean, we didn't have the... It's always a, yes. Because we didn't have any industrial heritage, uh, we decided, I mean, that uh, our new fields of activity would be based on innovation. And that's why, I mean, uh, we have been building, I mean, uh, uh, a roadmap of development of the, of the territory based on new fields of activity, and especially based on the uh, new fields of activities relying on the digital transformation of this territory. And uh, we have uh, uh, mainly, the next slide, I mean, three, three focus, I mean, uh, as probably most of the cities, I mean, one is related I mean, to the, the quality of life of, uh, of citizens and also globally of the attractiveness of the, of the territory, uh, keeping in mind that we have a high level of tourism uh, uh, activity, obviously. Uh, the second one is, is related I mean, to, the, uh, to the efficiency of the operation of the, I would say the city, but in that case the territory, because Obviously, digital is going is bringing a lot of uh, potential uh, increase of efficiency when you operate uh, a territory in terms of mutualization of resources, in terms of uh, having, a, let's say, a reduced type of heavy infrastructure and so on. And of course, this is related to the uh, setting of on the budget of the city. And the third one is economical development. And again, I mean, diversification of the economy has been one of the of the main, I mean, or I mean. The, been the main, I mean, uh, uh, vector of development. Um, so, maybe. So, so, what we what we decide to do is uh, to create a, a, an ecosystem based on digital transformation. So, this slide is really to show you, I mean, the, the methodology we adopted, which, by the way, is roughly, I mean, also the chronology. Right? It's also the how we uh, deployed, I mean, this uh, this approach of creating a, a, an innovation ecosystem. So the first, the first uh, step, I mean, 
was uh, related, I mean, to the possibility to have more interoperation between the activities of the cities first, and then the activities of the cities and the activity of the external uh, stakeholders, meaning uh, the uh, private sector and the academic world. And so we decided that the first thing is that the data, which are roughly the information, I would say, which are produced by all activities, should be more, uh, should be exchanged I mean, between the different activities, because it is a key. Uh, the key component to, if you want I mean, to mutualize, if you want to build new services, you have to exchange information and data. So we decided, we take the decisions to start from the, the bottom, so to develop a digital infrastructure owned by the city and, or, and uh, monitored and, uh, let's say, uh, controlled by the city itself. So we didn't delegate it on this. That was the first level. Uh, the second level is that uh, the data, as I said, uh, one thing is to collect I mean, this information, but the second thing is to share this information. So I will, of course, enter in really the details of this presentation about that. But the, re the real the goal, I mean, was really to create an interoperability between all the stakeholders who are producing data or who are consuming data. The, the third the third level is uh, <coughs> that we realize I mean that uh, the city, uh, the public sector, and I could even distinguish large companies, SMEs, and startups and the academic world were working on their own. There was not so much, I mean, interactions. Uh, and for instance, the, the relationship between the city and, uh, and the public sector was more uh, based on the contract and uh, on call for tenders. So it was, a, a, let's say, a customer to supplier type of relationship. And if we want to develop, I mean, innovation and new type of services, we need to move from a, a customer type of relationship to a partner type of relationship. And it's very different. And so we realized that we, we, we needed to create a, a, a collaborative environment, a collaborative, uh, I would say, platform, I would say. A place where we could effectively interact <coughs> all together, but a physical place and a, a governance model and methodology and so on. So um, not enough time I mean, to develop I mean, this part, but it's very important that you need I mean, to create I mean, this uh, sort of co-working space I mean, where the, the, the city administration, the companies, the private companies and the academic uh, uh, field can, uh, let's say, meet together in order to create together I mean, new projects and develop new solutions. The, the, the next one is uh, that if you, uh, if you want to build a new project, you need to create an ecosystem of partners. And obviously that's why we're creating this co-working space. And again, I mean, administration, companies, I mean, private sector and academic uh, sector. In addition, of course, and we will see the, that it's much more and more important to involve, of course, the citizens because these are the people who are targeting, of course. Uh, the, sec the, the, the next one was uh, we realized that uh, apart from the data which are produced in the territory, a big asset, and I think everyone has this asset, is the land itself, the territory itself. And we decided, I mean, to open, I mean, the territory. That's why I'm talking about the open lab, in order to demonstrate, to, to test and demonstrate, I mean, the, uh, the new, the new type of services, product, application, and uh, because in that case, I mean, first thing is you can uh, demonstrate at real scale, so you are really deploying in real conditions, and uh, the the additional uh, advantage is that when you do that, of course, it's also for the companies a way, it's a sort of showroom, uh, a real scale showroom, I mean, for the companies. So, uh, obviously, I mean, it's not for free because you need, I mean, it's not only to say, okay, you can, it's a, not a, only a playground. I mean, you need, as a city, to play a role in order to ease and to make this possible, of course. And the last, the last thing, in fact, the last thing, the, the last at this step as of today, is that we decided to create, a, they say, to focus on some fields of activities, not trying to address everything, uh, in order to be a little bit focused anyway. And there is one very important thing is that if you target the deployment of the <coughs> economy and uh, the, develop, develop, the develop, development of the, the companies, new companies or, or existing companies, it's very important at the test and time that you uh, produce in your region locally uh, the people, the skilled people who are going I mean, to, be, uh, to fuel I mean, this activity. And most of the companies, they are attracted by a, a region or a city because they can find them in the people to employ, to work, and to grow. So it's very important that, that the link with the, uh, the university and the, uh, let's say the academic world is, is targeting also uh, 
the possibility to integrate education, high-level education, within also this, uh, this strategy. So this slide is just very quickly to, to show that we, the, the three topics of, uh, of activities I mean, we, we focus on, uh, which are, one is a smart city, so you, I don't think you will be surprised about that. Uh, the second one is related to the health, and especially the health, uh, because, uh, because it's a very attractive region. We have a lot of uh, people retired, uh, in this region, so the pyramid of age is pretty high, meaning that average we are we are representing the pyramid of age of Europe in 25 years from now. So that's why also this place is interesting in terms of testing and this question on how we can uh, manage, I mean, the quality of life for elderly people and uh, how we can, uh, uh, I would say, manage also the, the the problem of people being becoming more dependent and try to keep the people in their social environment. And the third one, of course, I mean, is, of, is not to forget tourism, but is to address tourism in another uh, way uh, and working especially on, on e-tourism. And as the previous uh, presentation showed, I mean, there are still uh, a lot of things to do in, the, in terms of bonding. And uh, we are working on that, but this presentation, I think, will be of very strong, in the previous ones, very strong interest for some of the people <laughs> of, the, of the municipality. Uh, so the next one, just to show that, uh, as I already said, I mean, Innovation is really uh, a co uh, a co creation. That's th there is no way we can create. I mean, only the municipality with the company, without the university, or with the university, but forgetting <coughs> in the public sector and so, for instance, forgetting profitability aspect and so on. So we are ready to go through this process. And again, the citizen engagement is becoming more and more important, and we have still a lot of progress to do. And we are the beginning of that. Uh, especially engaging citizens from the early phase, from the beginning, understanding the needs is very important because you, usually we uh, involve people in the test and so on, but we forget to listen to the people first. And the key things to get people uh, change, okay, to, to get people uh, change their behavior, adopting new, new, new way of uh, whatever, let's say driving or, or using their personal vehicles or I don't know, taking care of the waste is really to, uh, to make the project their project from the beginning because it will be their project and then they will really understand why we are doing that. Um, so let's go down to the, the core of the, the, the presentation. As I said, I mean, the first stage in our strategy was to deploy them in a uh, digital infrastructure. And as you see in this presentation, the, the center of that is really the data warehouse, is where we are collecting, aggregating, structuring the data with two, of course, I mean, uh, uh, objectives. One is to be able to collect the data from whatever sources and including more and more now the IoT, so the Internet of Things with a massive deployment of sensors. And this is uh, technically a key challenge, definitely. And at the upper level, it's how we can develop services. And a large part of that is to put in place everything to give access from, for external uh, stakeholders, so of course internal departments of the city, but also any external stakeholders, including of course the private sector, to the data which are produced by the city. So it's not only, uh, uh, let's say, uh, storing, collecting data, it's really to make this data usable and make bringing value to this data for the external stakeholders. So the next slide. Uh, in that slide, what I try to, to show, I mean, is uh, is that if we look at, because the real, the real thing is all this has a cost, and this is a lot of uh, also, of course, infrastructure, but human resources. And uh, the question is, what is uh, the benefit we can get if we take care about collecting this data, structuring the data, uh, making them accessible, uh, qualifying the data, uh, in terms of return on investment for the city. So the, the first thing is, of course, there is a benefit for the city itself because it will improve, as I said before, uh, the mutualization of the, between the different activities. And that's uh, really the benefit and in terms of HR, in terms of digital infrastructure, in terms of creating new services to, to help better operate the city. Uh, the second level is uh, enabling the research for new services. Uh, there is one thing which is obvious is that if you want to develop new services and the services which will be offered tomorrow, whatever solutions, uh, it's important that you have people with advanced ideas being involved uh, because we don't know all the services which will be, uh, let's say, uh, uh, available in five or ten years from now. So it's important to involve the academic uh, research 
in that field, and also, of course, startups. And uh, in that case, the first thing was to say, okay, let's open I mean, the data to the, the research uh, environment uh, in order to work on the new, uh, the new type of services. And the third level, of course, is to make this data available for uh, private companies to develop commercial products. Uh, and we are talking about commercial. This means these companies are going to make money uh, developing services, solutions, products using data from the collectivity, from the, from the city. And of course, I mean, there is one thing, and I will insist, I will put, or put emphasis on that is you need first, I mean, to answer to the market demand. And if you want to that, to answer to this demand, the first thing is you need to provide high quality data. That's the first thing, and we will come back to this. Uh, it's important for us because we will strengthen I mean, the, the local attractiveness. And obviously, behind, and I will come back also to this, you need to understand what will be the new business model in order for the city itself you know, to get a, a return on investment. I would say financial, we will see that there are many, there are several ways I mean, to get a return on investment. It's not only a monetization, you can have other channels. So maybe next slide. Alors, this slide, I mean, is to illustrate, I mean, uh, what I call the value model uh, of the city data. Uh, so this idea, I mean, in order to illustrate and make things by hope, easier to understand, is we took as reference uh, the production of gas, uh, from the extraction of gas, I mean, to the distribution of gas, I mean, to, to run your car. Um, we think, as a city, that... Uh, 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 there is a, a, a part of the heritage of the city is the, the data we are producing. Everything produced by the city is, is a part of our assets. And every city uh, has this type of asset, as long, of course, as you can produce the data and make this data accessible. That's why I, uh, I insisted before on the, the fact that you need to rely on an infrastructure operated or not by the city, but at least something you control. Uh, so the first thing is to collect the data. And uh, that's really the, the, the data collection is very important because very often we realize that a large part of the, the data is, uh, is not really accessible. Uh, it is contained in, uh, in uh, software which are used in this type of department, but I mean, it's inside, I mean, so it's not, a, it's not a, it cannot be shared easily. So there is a real work from the beginning to say, okay, everything we are doing, let's take the data, outside, I mean, the, 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 the scope of the original activity, because it can be used by other people. Uh, the second stage, and like in, uh, in, um, in for the petrol, is uh, the transformation of the data. Uh, so I, I, I took the, I call for a, a, what we call a refinery. You have to refine I mean, this data, because the work data are very raw data. They have been produced for one per per specific purpose. Uh, which doesn't mean that this data can be used as is. It's like the, the raw gas, I mean, you cannot put it in your car. I mean. There are a lot of work which has to be done before you can use it and it has a value. If you, if you just take the raw data extracted and you put them on a whatever port, open portal, there is no way that almost nobody, maybe some academics, can use this data. So it has no value. Like if I take the petrol extracted from the ground, if I, if, I, if I have a big barrel, I cannot do anything with that. It's even a pollution, it's a problem to store, to manage, and so on. So that means that we have to go through a, 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 give it this, we have to go through a process, incremental process, from the raw work data, in order to uh, contextualize the data, how these data have been generated, at what time, in which condition, and so on, then to create a, a, what we call a situational data, which means in which context, in which environmental context it has, it has been generated. Just to give you an idea, if I'm measuring the ozone for pollution, uh, the ozone level will, be, will make sense if we understand what was the humidity level, what was the temperature, and so on. So it's not only the, the ozone level uh, of the sensor, it's also the other parameters. And then we, what, what the purpose of this data? Is to go to the prediction to be more predictive, meaning that this data will allow me to understand what things are ongoing to be. And at the end, the idea is to take a decision. Uh, because the, the role of this data, I mean, at the end, when you talk about the service, is to take a decision. So we have to go through this process, through analytics, which will make the data, transformation of the data from the raw work data to a data which will help whoever, so it could be our long mile, or could be whatever, let's say, uh, uh, external companies to take a decision. And at that level, we go to the data distribution. 
And that's where it's important to understand, I mean, that uh, when we have to go to the data distribution, the market, <coughs> the external stakeholders, they, are, they want data which is of value, which can help them, for instance, to take decisions. But they need also data which are going to be qualified. Because one of the problems we have, even in these open data portals sometimes, is uh, the validity of the data, the reliability of the data, is not really, uh, is not guaranteed. And because it's open, it's free, I mean, nobody really cares. And very often you find data which are out of date, or which are not very precise and so on. So the, quality, the certification of, of, that, of the data, considering even the city as a, third, a sort of trusted third party, I mean, we, I think as a city we have a credibility, we are credible. And so we need, of course, to make this data certified. We need to guarantee the access 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and so on, because these data are going now to be used for commercial application, so no disruption. Uh, we need to consider the, um, also the, uh, uh, yes, the business model. I think business model, as I said, is very important uh, at that level, because are we going to just offer the data? Are we going to exchange data with external stakeholders? Uh, versus, for instance, the results of their own analytics for our own operation of the city. You know, it's sort of a, of a deal. Huh? We trade them in. Uh, for instance, this is the type of things that Waze, for instance, is offering cities in Europe with the Connected Citizen Program. They say, okay, we want to have your all your data about the, the work, road repairs, or whatever you are going to do on the op open, open, uh, open field, I mean, on the streets. In exchange, Waze is, is uh, delivering to you, but for your own use of the city. Uh, the, the traffic data uh, collected from all I mean, the users of waste. So it's a sort of deal, I mean, so there is no money exchange in that case. Obviously, if you want to monetize, that means you need to reach a level where the data has a real value for the services which are going to be given, meaning that for the company who is going to get the data, if they don't have access to this data, either they cannot provide the service or the quality or the reliability of the service will be much lower. So let's go to the, the, the next, no, it's the, the, the last slide. Now, hmm, yeah. the orange thing is not a so good idea. Uh, uh, but in any case, uh, I think this slide, it will be accessible and you will have to enter in the details of the, uh, uh, of the, of the slide. Or maybe I don't know if it's possible just to, if you just uh, select everything you color in, in, in black. Maybe it's too complex. No, no. Okay, well, never mind. No, no, it was just, uh, yeah. Well, we can, yes, we can maybe zoom on, on, the, on the left first. Uh, this slide, in fact, is to show you, because I think it's really key, is to understand why, I mean, the private sector and the public sector, who are both using data and producing data, could find a, a, a place where they have a, a, I mean, a common interest. And why the, public, the private sector could come to the public sector to say, okay, I may need your data and I maybe even uh, open I mean, to pay for that. And on the other side, why the uh, private sector, the public sector could say, okay, I have data and I see an interest to share this data, which may be sensitive, for instance, uh, with, the, with the private sector. So first level, I mean, when we start from the data from the public, so the, 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 the left is the public side. Uh, let's say the first stage, usually it's open data, meaning we have data. We give access, it's a free open access, I mean, to this data, whatever open data portal. Uh, it could be well uh, presented, as it was presented yesterday for Puto, for the city of Puto, or it could be, uh, let's say, uh, only, or both, API, in order for external software to have an easy access, I mean, or web access, whatever the, the, the type of protocol. Uh, in that case, usually, if you observe in the data, what we do is, we have, we have a good format, for a good way to format the data and stop based on standards, and uh, we give the accessibility. On the other side, I mean, these public data are usually cold data, so it's more, uh, very often static information, not so often real-time information, dynamic information, start to be a lot of statistics and general information, which can be, by the way, collected in other places, so it's an easy way, an, e an easy access, a guichet unique, I would say. And that's the point. Now, the, the evolution we have, we have, and I think many cities have now, is to move to what we call smart data. In that case, I mean, the idea is that we are going to take this, uh, the, 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 we are going to open the data which are uh, produced by the activity of the city and by the daily activity, 
So this is what I call work data at the bottom, meaning it's operational data, it's real-time data, uh, data which are sensed coming from the uh, devices which are deployed in real. And uh, with uh, uh, um, a process where we are going to enrich and qualify this data. So in order for to be used for production, to be able to distribute, to be able to reuse I mean, this information. And as a, as a, let's say, physical infrastructure, we need, uh, we need in that case to rely on the city data platform. So it could be stored like us, it's, it's, it's uh, host on our own da in our own data center, but for a smaller city, or it's a choice, I mean, it could be also in a, in a, in a, in a cloud. You still, still need, I mean, of course, to have a, a, sub a level of security. Uh, you need to provide, I mean, API, much more advanced API and web access. And you need, I mean, to implement, uh, especially for the Internet of Things, the device management. There is uh, high-level device management because it's very tough, I mean, to manage sensors. Uh, uh, and very, very soon it will be hundreds of thousands of sensors, uh, very different. And uh, with real-time data, some can be off or can have a problem. So that's big. And the goal, I mean, uh, will be to go to business data. But then now I'm going to the... Next, uh, if we can go to the, the, the full right, from the public sector, and then we will see that, I will finish my talk about the middle. So on the, on the right, which is the set data, maybe we can zoom a little bit. Yes, yes exactly, like you did, mm -hmm. yes, perfect. Yeah. Um, originally, most of the companies, they were using, uh, the naming is not, uh, okay, it's, it's the way, I mean, we call that, I mean, but you could find all the naming. We call it self data. This is the data which are produced by a commercial activity and used for this commercial activity. So usually it's not so much exchange, I mean, with other companies. Uh, it's really internal use. So this is, uh, I would say, private data coming from the data from the customer, their profile, and so on. Uh, it's used for outposts, I mean, the production, and also for the sales aspect, for the marketing, for the business. And this is typically a, a lot of companies, uh, as soon as they were on the, on the web or even before that, I mean, they use, especially with the web, I mean, they are now, I mean, this type of, of, of uh, way of operating, and uh, that's normal. Uh, internal use, because uh, it's important in terms of, uh, for, yet for them, for the quality of service, for the management of their business, and for the, the customer's loyalty. I mean, so it's very, it's a very local, locally, local, uh, local use, I would say, of the, of the data by the company. And now with the big, I mean, the, the, the big companies, I mean, uh, e-commerce companies or, or whatever, even now, I mean, social networking companies, I mean, we're also uh, with the business model relying on advertisements and so on, and traffic. Uh, obviously, they, are, they move, I mean, to the real big data, meaning that they start, I mean, to agri-correlate their own data produced by the data which are produced uh, by other parties. And they made, I mean, this, uh, so the two important stages, massification, so, but classification is really what I would call big data, and analytics, running analytics on this. And the idea is to have a best better profiling of customers, to have a vision, uh, let's say, much more advanced marketing, and to try to, uh, to work on new services they are going to offer, so the, service, the services of tomorrow. Uh, and they're going to correlate them I mean, in their, I would say the same data, the data they are generating by their own activity, their own services, with data from partners, so sometimes they are, can even purchase, and we know that many companies are purchasing, I mean, uh, you know, a massive data was produced by other companies. Uh, uh, analytic data, they are, all, they are producing, or some other companies, and I think recent political campaign, I mean, uh, I think ways, I mean, this, uh, this question of uh, having uh, analytics uh, companies, uh, let's say, making this type of uh, work. And of course, I mean, so data purchase or exchange or, or coming from social network, for instance, which data which are on the open, I would say, but they are which have to be crunched and, and managed. And of course, they need to run massive analytics and they develop, I mean, service <coughs> platform, a lot of applications. And that was the point. And now, the, the conclusion, uh, conclusion is more, more a step for, for two more ways. Uh, we are now in the business data. It's at the end. This guy, why, I mean, why, uh, let's say, even an Amazon and so on, could, uh, could want to, to make a deal, I mean, with the uh, city, or with cities? And why city could make a deal, I mean, with Amazon, or with, let's say, companies? Uh, so the question is that the big data produced by the public sector and the small data coming from the territory, when they are coming to be con connected or aggregated together, they can become, uh, we call it business data. Maybe it's not really meaningful, but, the idea was that if we uh, 
the mutualization of these two types of data can is going, I mean, to create a, a, a create a value. And for this, I mean, why? Because uh, we can correlate, I mean, uh, data coming from whatever, uh, let's say, users' activity and uh, commercial activities with, uh, let's say, the way, I would say, let's say, the, the pulse, like in health, I mean, the pulse of the city. How the city is behaving, what happening in the city, what are the flows of people, and so on. A lot of things <coughs> which are not really uh, known by, by these companies. And so we have other, other type of information which are of importance for them. Uh, the second thing is they need uh, information which are reliable because they may, of course, extract a lot of information without the city. But at the end, I mean, they need information that the city uh, can qualify. That's very important why if we don't qualify the data which are, we are producing and we get, don't give them a good level of certification and reliability, there is no value I mean, for these companies. Uh, and, uh, of course, I mean, uh, this, uh, let's say, Data uh, may be the mix I mean, between this data between the context, the context of the city, and uh, the, the context of the users' services, uh, which are users oriented, is making I mean, a link which is today of benefit for a certain number of companies. And we see, as in this, more and more companies coming to us and say, okay, we would like I mean, to have access to these and these data. Obviously, these data are not available uh, on the open portal because as I said, it's limited data. And uh, this data, sometimes they could effectively know a little bit of this data, but they will not have a very accurate and reliable information. Uh, again, I mean, uh, Waze, it's Google now, uh, they came to us, and they, or to cities, I mean, we could say why, I mean, they are their, their city users, but the problem is they cannot give a good uh, recommendations and especially give a, a, a prediction of what will be the traffic impact if they don't know what will be the road repairs, when the road work is going to start, when it will end, if there are events which are created and then we have a demonstration in the street like with Gilets Jaunes, and the, the street will be blocked from this time to this time. I mean, they need, I mean, this, and the city has this information, not the, not the, these guys, I mean. So it's really for, the, ha, let's say, adding a level of quality, I mean, to this. And so, as of today, what we are looking at is this type of discussion is uh, which type of public-private partnership we could set up I mean, with, uh, with uh, 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 private companies uh, in order to, uh, in some case, uh, uh, create, because, again, I mean, if we want I mean, to share the data, monetize the data, bring them to a good level of qualification, we need, I mean, this is something that, at least in France, at the legal level, it's complex to do. We cannot, we cannot sell the data as a city. So we need to create an external entity with a special legal, uh, legal definition, probably with stakes from the city and stakes from, uh, public, from the private sector. Even, we could say that sometimes uh, public institutions could even invest in that. And this entity will work on, the, on this qualification and this, uh, as I said, moving the data from, I would say, quali basic qualified data from the, from the city uh, to uh, more decisional data, for example, predictive data. This has to be done with analytics and advanced research in the, by, and managed by this type of company who is going to develop a business model. And it has to be on the long term, of course, profitable. Because at that level, we realize, I mean, that the city itself cannot be sustainable. At, uh, uh, at, meaning, we can, of course, exchange data and so on. But if we want really to value the data, to bring them at a good, at a value for the market, you need also to do marketing to understand what will be the new services of tomorrow and so on. Uh, maybe to complete the, the to end, because I think I'm maybe out of time. Uh, well, uh, there is one, just one thing to, just an illustration is. We are uh, owning, I mean, the water distribution company. We are deploying smart meters. The smart meters are measuring, as you can imagine, the water consumption for each user. Uh, originally, this was uh, put in place, so these smart meters, water smart meters, you know, for billing reasons. And so that means the, 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 the water distribution company owned by the city needs this information normally every month, no more than that. Uh, 
because I mean we have also always like everywhere leaks in the network and so on. It's interesting for them to have information maybe every day or or to every two days in order to see if the, 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 the water which is distributing for the production plant uh, is effectively equal or not to the water which is really consumed by all the consumers. And then you can effectively detect, I mean, if there is a, a discrepancy uh, between the, the numbers, that maybe there is a leak somewhere. somewhere. Now, uh, if we go further, if we, if we consider that the water meter, and it can do that technically, is uh, uh, sending an information on the water consumed every minute, for instance, and maybe making a measurement every one tenth of seconds all the time. Uh, in that case, you can get, of course, an information on how the people are consuming the water, even which uh, part, which equipment is consuming the water. Is it the toilet? Is it the shower? It is just the tap and so on. So you have a profiling and a signature analysis of the water consumption. And then you can understand, I mean, what is happening uh, in the home of the person. So it's very private data, of course. But if you have, and that's, uh, I come back to he helps. If you are taking care about elderly people and we try to maintain dependent people alone in their home, uh, obviously when the people, they have a, a regular way of life and you can detect, I mean, a change in their life. So the first thing is, in the morning, the person has not uh, used, I mean, the water. She didn't go to the toilet, for instance, between 7 and 8 a.m. like every day. There is definitely probably a problem. So you can call somebody, of course, and somebody to just to check, I mean, what happening? Maybe the person <laughs> fell down when she went, went to the toilet or she has a problem, she's still in the bed, it's not, it's something abnormal. And the second level is uh, for uh, type of Alzheimer type of, uh, you know, uh, disease. You can see a change in the behavior of the person. You see that the person starts, I mean, to wake up earlier and earlier, to leave during the night, you know, the, 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 the sense of the time is different for this person. You can see also that the person, for instance, is going to activate the, 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 the toilet 10 times, not only once, 10 times, and these type of things, opening the tap, closing the tap, opening, the, all these signatures. So it's very important for medical use. You can get a lot of information. So it was just to say that the same data, the same information, if it is sampled with a completely different uh, frequency, with an accurate, uh, uh, let's say, in real time, I mean, uh, uh, let's say, put, uh, connection, uh, can be used for uh, health uh, application, which can go up to maybe uh, trying to possibly giving the possibility to sense of the life of somebody. And so the value of the same data is completely different for the water distribution company or for a health service. A health service, because in one case it's just a billing for one month of trans water co consumption. In the other case, it's maybe the life of somebody, of your grandmother. So that's why the, it's very important that that's why the model at the, be at the middle. When you want to uh, value your data, of course, it has to be qualified and so on, but you need to understand who is going to be used, who is used to this data for which purpose, and this will make, I mean, the, how the value of the data. So the same data will have different values depending on who is going to do what with this data. So if the services have not the same business model, of course, the value will be different. So it's, uh, I'm sorry because it's uh, maybe a bit, a bit fast and uh, you will get I mean, the, the, this, but uh, it's part of the, this reflection which is a pretty tough stuff, so topic today for cities and I wanted to share that uh, with you today and thanks for I mean, this opportunity uh, for the city, Stoke City Challenge I mean, that you give me. Thank you. Thank you. I think it was a burning topic for many of our cities and uh, a very big part of it was covered. Unfortunately, we cannot open for questions. I have to invite my colleague Gerard for the next session to take over. Thank you, Lecture. Before we open it and we set up the, uh, the, the panel, I would like to invite also the other panelists um, to, the, um, uh, to the panel table. So please, if um, Anna, uh, Maria, uh, Javier, and Isabel can take a seat. And I would like to ask you as well, please, this session is going to be between um, you need your headphones because they will be half in Spanish and half in, um, in English. 
So if you need some time just to get the headphones, yeah. that would be very useful. And why? Um, everybody's taking a seat and maybe to stretch your legs. Let's give two, three minutes. <laughs> Sí, 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 sí. So hello everybody, um, we're going to start the next session, hopefully everybody is here. Uh, let me just um, wait for the people who are outside, I'm going to introduce the panelists and then we, we are ready. Just um, I'm talking on, uh, looking at it, uh, Pierre, how long time do we have? Because I know that we are behind schedule. One hour. One hour, so it means if we have five, ten minutes maximum each, but we're going to be shorter than that, promise? So, without any more delays, I'm going to introduce the panelists and you will understand the whole background, why we put together um, this, thematic, um, this thematic session. So, um, the, first one, the first one on my right is um, Anna, Anna Rodes Carbonell. 
A lot of this carbonate is uh, representing ITEX, which is a technological institute which is based in the city, in the challenged city of Alcoy. So the city of Alcoy would like, uh, would like to uh, give this, um, um, to show how they work together, how they create knowledge around, the, uh, around their city, their territory, and how they work together with the industry, the textile industry, because alcohol is very much focused on textile, and with the uh, Technological Institute. Just to let me know that also textile sector, uh, you will learn later on, is very important for all across Europe and many regions in Europe, in particular for the southern countries like another challenge city, Guimarães, who is um, over there. They will have a say on that. Um, and also uh, Romania as well. Also in new um, in uh, in research in new technologies for Germany as well in new um, uh, in fashion and tech and how to integrate new technologies. So Anna is going to present this uh, this perspective. Then we have the perspective of um, Anna uh, Maria Maria Elena is an SME um, is a women entrepreneurship, but she going to talk about what does it mean for a, a young talented uh, woman and also for a fashion designer in the uh, in the textile sector and how to use new technologies allows her to live in a city in a small city but sell um, uh, worldwide and then at the very end we have a tandem of a two we change sector we're going to talk about the leather uh, the leather sector, which is also a very important sector for the uh, manufacturing sector for, for Europe. And uh, um, they're going uh, to gonna work hand in hand when elected members. So we have a major uh, a first, Isabel Gomez Garcia, um, who's going to present what they're doing in the city for the, craft, for the crafter, but also in the management of the city for digital literacy to involve uh, kids and children. And um, Javier, Javier Gallego, who is representing a research institute financed by the region of Andalusia, but based in a small village in the, in the county of, um, uh, of Cadiz, in Ubrique. And all the work that they're doing together with the municipality and the region to retain and also to attract talent, fashion designers, to set to live and uh, settle in this small village in the, in the mountains. Just uh, this is the background of everybody, and now very, very, um, very rapidly, I'm just going to give you some figures and why this in uh, this specific sector that in uh, the European Commission we call it the light industry sector, covering clothing, textile, footwear, and also leather is a key manufacturing sector um, now for Europe. Um, uh, first of all, um, in terms of um, uh, what does it mean this industry sector is a turnover of um, 500 billion and an economic value of 150 million and the employment and is employing 5 million people all across Europe. So already that is it's important. Um, the vast majority of this um, of this sector as we are micro enterprises, mm -hmm. and uh, some of them are also individuals and crafters. And so, and most of these companies they are not going beyond 90, uh, 90, 90 people. And at the same time, there is a micro. Uh, there is all the companies, auxiliary companies, working for them. In terms of technological, they also they have a challenge on uh, how to integrate new techniques, know-how, and um, to integrate it in their processes. And also at the same at the same time they have a problem of aging population. So it means in, in getting attractiveness, getting new talents to work for this specific sector. In addition to other environmental challenges, because some of these um, uh, manufacturing companies, the textile, but also the, the leather industry, 
they are heavily contaminant or pollutants. So there is also a, uh, a policy behind as well for the European, for the European uh, perspective to work on circular economy and they have a heavy pressure as well to be clean as well. And, um, but at the same time, for Europe it's very important because you know um, how important and how creative these industries could be because they work together as well, for instance, with fashion designers, with um, crafters, and they're very creative. And obviously it is, uh, it's an, it is an opportunity in particular for the territories where they are based. And this is very, um, very uh, succinctly the background I would like to give you. And on that note, I'm going to pass the, uh, the floor first, uh, first to Anna to explain to you which and a study that they did, uh, commissioned by the region of Valencia, which is a cluster for uh, covering two sectors, footwear and also textile, and the results that they have. So please, um, Anna, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Piedad. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before beginning my presentation, I would like to acknowledge the organization and, and the city of Alcoy, the opportunity to offer us to participate in this seminar to support the promotion of digital transformation. It is really the only way for companies to remain competitive in a globalized market. Today, I'm going to talk about the results obtained within the development of a project executed by ATEX last year. The objective of the project was to promote the digital transformation of the textile sector at the Valencian community. Okay, uh, my, presentation, my presentation structure starts with a brief description of ITEX and the Industry 4.0 project highlighting the results obtained uh, and the barriers detected through an industry survey about factories digitalization. The following part will, will define the action plan applied and the pilot test developed. Finally, there will be proposed some steps for a good application of the digital technology technologies in your companies. I'll try to answer all of your questions after my presentation. For those who don't know ITEX, it is a textile research institute located in Alcoy, Alicante, Spain. It is a national reference center for innovation, research, and advanced technical services for companies in the textile sector. I would like to highlight the main focus of ITEX, that is to offer support to companies in order to increase in competitive and innovation. One moment, because we have a technical problem. Okay, now. <laughs> the project developed is called Industry 4.0 Textile Sector, and the results, well, it, is, it was done because, as you know, the textile sector has always been very traditional with a low level of innovation and technology. Nevertheless, as I have already said, the digitalization and the change of mind is necessary to remain competitive in a globalized market. So, the arrival of the digital technologies is both a challenge and opportunity for the companies. On the one hand, customers have become now more demanding. They ask a higher level in the product's customization, in shorter time and with a higher quality and without an increase in the price they pay. But on the other hand, with the new technologies, the companies have a tool to face those challenges. So that project seeks to promote initiatives to encourage the implementation of these new technologies in the textile sector. Yeah. For that purpose, the first step of the project was to know 
the current status status of the industry uh, of the textile industry sector in relation to digitalization. And how did we do that? We carried out surveys between 150 companies from different subsectors and sizes. The surveys cover all the internal processes of an organization, from the manufacturing to the digitalization of the final product. I have summarized the main results of the survey, and the most shocking one was the very low le level of knowledge. Training and knowledge are the basis of a digitalization process. Without them, it's not possible to carry out such a process. In general, the digital digitalization implementation level is medium and low, except the biggest companies characterized by a high level of implementation due to, the, due to their investment capacities. The customization <coughs> degree in the textile sector is quite good, so the companies can modify the products as the demand requires. About the digital staff skills, skills it's obvious that we have a problem. Work, workers of the textile industry do not have the preparation <coughs> do not have the preparation to use new software and digital devices. It's very important to promote the digital talent with previous training but also with continuous training at work. And which are the barriers to the digital transformation for companies? In the survey, the main hurdle revealed is represented by the possibilities to invest but also is very important the culture of the flow change of the business. As your digitalization level depends on the raw material provider level together with the customer industries level. Another important factor is the resistance to change. About the product digitaliz digitalization, only half of the, of the survey companies are aware of smart textiles. If we analyze the answers, we observe that more than the 50% of the companies that don't know about the smart textiles could be interested in including, in including them in their product list. Well, to summarize, the, conclusion, the conclusions of the study are that there is a high level of ignorance of opportunities and available technologies, the lack of a specific technological solutions for the textile sector because this problem is in a continuous loop. Because with a specific technological solutions for the textile sector, uh, suppliers will not be aware of this necessity, so they won't produce them. And the last one, the barriers to digital transformation that, as we have already said, are cost, culture, and the resistance to change. So which was the action plan proposed in the project? Which was the action plan? For the first barrier, it's necessary dissemination and training. For example, visiting companies or the, with the publication of recommendations. For the second one, we have promote the development of solutions of the textile sector, looking for specialized suppliers and informing them about the sector needs. And for the barriers to digitalization, we did a general roadmap and we developed several pilot projects with different technologies applied to real companies. Now I'm going to show you two short videos of this pilot project. The first one is about the implementation of RFID labels for the live location of the fabric product. The system is based on antennas located in the ceiling and labels stick on the fabric products. Through radio frequency, the exact location of the products are determined. facilitates an artificial vision system. It detects automatically fabric errors in a more accurate and fast manner. I 
I share with you two recommendations for a good application of the digitalization, the, well, the digital technologies in your companies. Oh. Another technical problem. So if you can mention in the yeah. basically. Yeah. Well, I don't find the, the slide, but it's not, it's not a problem. Because the first, the first uh, conclusion is that you need to have a good planification and don't implement technologies just for being digital. You must focus on which objectives you need to achieve to have an economical return. After that, it's necessary to analyze which processes of your factory are, are affected by these objectives. And only then you must identify which technologies will help you to improve the, to improve the system. And the last one, is about the schedule of the digitalization. It, would be, it should be planned in phases. In other words, you cannot want to have a smart factory all at once. We strongly recommend to separate it in different phases, if <coughs> starting from the actual situation towards the reference model. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask me or contact me by email. And thank you all for your time. Anna and for sticking uh, to the time. So um, we are going to stay in this sector, the textile sector, so uh, maybe the questions, uh, I will take one or two questions on that before we pass to the, um, uh, to the level one. So Maria, if you can explain, uh, introduce us um, your experience and your story. And also, uh, before Maria gets ready, I have to say as well that uh, um, Maria is uh, also uh, receiving a coaching and uh, an incubation program mm -hmm. from the Cosmic program as well. In, uh, it's called Worth Partnership Project. It is one of the in actions, a small action, but uh, it's lasting four years. And it, um, and it provides a little seed money, so 10,000, not a lot, but allows the companies that they work on partnership to go through a coaching program uh, during 12 months to work with other uh, technological companies or manufacturing companies and to do some research and uptake to get prototypes as well and to take their uh, their product into the market so and i just stop there so yeah, Thank you very much, uh, Pina, for your presentation, also for the uh, European Commission uh, for inviting us to this uh, seminar. Um, in order to be more than happy to switch to Spanish, I guess you will have a translator otherwise. Just in case you have any questions, you can do it both in English and Spanish, but I will start speaking now in Spanish. I hope it won't be a problem. Um, eh, mi nombre es María Irena, vengo en nombre de Motoreta, es una eh, marca de moda infantil. Eh, basada en Sevilla y eh, vengo un poco a exponer nuestro caso como un ejemplo muy concreto de una empresa que, que nace y se desarrolla en un entorno muy local como es Sevilla a unas dos horas de aquí eh, pero que tiene un proyecto eh, de internalización y local como eh, global perdón como muy claro es el principio no es por eso el nombre de la eh, conferencia local production local distribution eh, porque a la vez es muy importante para nosotros mantener eh, la identidad del, del lugar en el que venimos. Eh, podemos resumirlo en, eh, en esto que, que, que os muestro. Es, eh, no es un término nuevo, el local thinking eh, es algo que se viene hablando desde hace mucho tiempo, que, pero para nosotros tiene todo el sentido. Eh, ¿Cómo se llega a ese eh, pensamiento? local y de qué, y de qué forma eh, eh, podemos utilizar la, la tecnología para, para apoyarnos. Bueno, estoy viendo aquí que se ha movido esto un poco. Eh, un momento. Sí, aquí. Eh, como comentaba, eh, Motor es una eh, marca de moda infantil eh, que viene de Sevilla, eh, un lugar con unas características identitarias pues, muy concretas y muy y muy únicas que a la vez le, 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 aportan, le aportan valor eh, como peculiaridad de la marca porque es importante tener claro las referencias locales y el mensaje o el valor que, 
que proyecta tu marca como eh, característica peculiar, pues nace en un estudio de arquitectura. Tanto eh, mi socia como yo somos, somos arquitectas, hemos desarrollado proyectos de diversa índole en los últimos eh, 10-12 años, eh, pero hace 5 o 6 años eh, nos embarcamos en ese nuevo proyecto eh, como una nueva forma de canalizar también un poco nuestra producción eh, creativa. Eh, en el camino, mucho aprendizaje, evidentemente, y muchas eh, herramientas que utilizar que nos permiten alcanzar el objetivo eh, global que, nos, que os pues, planteaba. Como segundo valor eh, de marca, además del hecho de, desde el punto de vista estético, ser arquitecta, el compromiso con eh, lo local, lo local en el concepto y lo local en la producción. Es eso que, que os vamos a decir, es decir, eh, a la hora de, de planificar nuestro concepto creativo, eh, utilizamos como referencia el propio territorio, eh, lugares de Andalucía que nos inspiran especialmente, eh, o tradicional, o los la, o la, o eh, eh, valores estéticos tradicionales, pero desde un punto de vista muy, muy contemporáneo, porque tenemos un público eh, muy internacional que tiene que ser capaz de detectar esos valores, pero no eh, encasillarlos. Eh, ¿Por qué? Porque todos estos valores locales aportan eh, valor a la marca, ¿no? es la importancia de la historia detrás de la, de la, de la marca. Entonces, cada, dos, cada, cada año desarrollamos dos, eh, dos colecciones eh, que desarrollan un, un tema que se vincula de una forma u otra con Andalucía y el lugar, y el lugar en, el que, en el que vivimos. ¿no? Eh, ¿Por qué? Porque al final eh, el valor de lo hecho en España, de lo hecho en Andalucía, se valora, se valora positivamente fuera. ¿no? Es decir, la moda de España se ve en el mundo como una garantía de eh, calidad y, y buen diseño. Algo que a lo mejor hace unos años no hemos sido capaces de vender o de creer nosotros mismos. Por otro lado, el compromiso con la producción local, también como un valor añadido a la marca. Eh, nuestra producción está eh, básicamente eh, desarrollada en Sevilla, parcialmente eh, también en talleres en Portugal, en la zona norte y para que aquí hay también ciudad que está presente. Eh, es decir, que es una, es una empresa eh, pequeña, con un núcleo duro de unas ocho personas, pero que puntualmente da, eh, em, emplea entre 40 y 50 personas durante los picos de, de producción. Es decir, que eh, merece la pena apostar por pequeñas empresas porque al final el impacto económico es, y de marca en el mundo es, es enorme. Entonces, eh, desde nuestro estudio eh, controlamos la producción, el impacto de, de la marca, el, el control de la calidad de, de la imagen y el, eh, la estrategia comercial. Pasamos al ser global. Primer objetivo, o sea, primer paso, establecer el, el cliente final. ¿no? Entonces, nuestro cliente final es un eh, cliente internacional que valora positivamente la historia que hay detrás, detrás de la marca, que valora el hecho de la producción local y la visión contemporánea del, del, del producto, así como su relación con el territorio. ¿Cuál es la estrategia digital y, y, eh, internacional que hay detrás? Eh, es una combinación entre presencia offline y presencia online. Es decir, nosotros eh, tenemos presencia en 25 países, en más de 150 puntos de venta. Esto se ha alcanzado, eh, por un lado, la asistencia tradicional a ferias comerciales y luego la presencia como marca en plataformas eh, de venta B2B, eh, showrooms eh, virtuales, eh, etc. Pero ambas partes van eh, eh, íntimamente ligadas, ya que creemos eh, enormemente que para poder consolidar las relaciones eh, comerciales, al final es, el face to face es, es importante. ¿no? Entonces, es eh, como eh, indicamos aquí en la presentación, una mezcla eh, inteligente y medida de las herramientas online y las eh, herramientas eh, offline. 
Y también teniendo en cuenta que eh, las relaciones comerciales progresivamente se están tendiendo a andar. Entonces, en ese sentido, no podemos quedarnos detrás. Pero como comentaba Ana también, eh, ese cambio de la digitalización tiene que ser progresivo y tiene que ser eh, orgánico para que pueda ser para que la estructura de la propia empresa lo pueda, lo pueda soportar. Eh, aquí, eh, bueno, pues eh, se da una idea eh, de eh, cómo hemos desarrollado eh, nuestra estrategia comercial en la que eh, se encuentra la presencia de agentes locales y distribuidores que realmente tienen el, el conocimiento profundo del, del, del mercado, ¿no? Eh, a la vez como empresa hemos tenido que ser, como empresa eh, pequeña, eh, localmente eh, ubicada pero internacionalmente presente, hemos tenido también que aprender a ser eh, muy flexibles a la hora de eh, adaptarnos e implementar eh, herramientas que permitan a, adaptarnos a, a las necesidades locales de cada mercado. ¿no? Aquí hay algunos, algunos ejemplos eh, muy concretos, eh, desde eh, logística, eh, distintos sistemas de, de pago, eh, aperturas de, de canales de venta eh, en Asia a través de WeChat eh, o incluso atender eh, tendencias de moda distintas en función, de, en función de, del mercado. Para una marca como la nuestra la importancia de, de Internet no es solamente, o de las herramientas digitales no se basa solamente en, el, en la estrategia comercial, sino también en entender al cliente final al que nos dirigimos, es decir, eh, todo esto son eh, imágenes, contenidos que produce el cliente final que se ubica en cualquier parte del mundo pero que ha sabido entender el concepto y el, y el valor de, de, de la marca, ¿no? Entonces, por, eso nos permite construir una comunidad eh, global que nos da una, un feedback inmediato de cómo se recibe, de cómo se recibe el producto, ¿no? Eh, ahora estamos hiperconectados eh, y para nosotros como marca eso es, es un, tiene un valor incalculable. La buena noticia para cualquier empresa de nuestro tamaño es que no estamos solos, es decir, eh, hay multitud de, de programas, eh, tanto estatales, locales, eh, regionales, que nos permiten... Eh, desarrollar esa fase de digitalización y internalización eh, acompañados. ¿no? De, aquí hay algunos ejemplos de eh, organizaciones que en algún momento nos han eh, dado algún tipo de, de soporte para desarrollar eh, distintos distintas, eh, aspectos de nuestra empresa. Eh, por último, eh, simplemente eh, profundizar en esa idea de, eh, de que es posible estar localmente eh, ubicado como empresa en una pequeña ciudad como Sevilla o cualquiera, o cualquiera de las eh, aquí presentes, pero eh, desarrollar un proyecto completamente internacional de calidad eh, y que sea, y que sea eh, aceptado en, en un eh, cliente final completamente internacional. Eh, nada más por mi parte en caso de tener cualquier que si hay cuestión o mi request I would be happy to answer later oh. no. yeah. ok, thank you Maria for this uh, enlightening uh, presentation and also this important message that you passed that uh, um, in a very short time this little company that now there are uh, two CEOs and five people the have built a brand and now you're selling directly in Paris, New well, York? Yeah, we, we, we attend trade shows in New York, uh, Florence, Paris, Tokyo and Shanghai. Directly, but you have a series and of... And then we have a net of agents and distributors so which can um, reach a, a, a wider world. Yeah. So these um, little companies and startups are making a change as well in this uh, in the in this sector, in the textile sector. So I will take why we change the slide. I can take uh, one uh, uh, one or two questions, but very very shortly. If you have a question on the textile uh, sector, anyone? Yeah, please, Alan. Yes. I have a question about the. Did you 
plan or do you have in mind uh, to, to use them in digitalization in order to produce customized, I mean, uh, uh, customized, I mean, uh, clothes, especially for children. I mean, uh, they, they can try something and then you can customize very quickly the production in order to have something very specific. Like, you know, sometimes they love something and so on and you look like this, for example, their t shirt or pullover or whatever. Is it something like that? Well, this is something that we have never thought about it, but, um, <coughs> yeah, now I have a team. <laughs> okay. No, this is something that uh, we never uh, thought about, but um, it could be, why not? I mean, it's, um, it has to be a balance between um, our values, also in the margin of customization that we are, that we are like, uh, agree to do with the final customer. But uh, definitely, it's always good to have the the the, the data and the analysis of uh, what is being a bestseller in every country and every area to to be able to uh, present a, a, a more adequate product to the final customer. Next time, ask for another question if there is any. Gimaraj, for instance, or no? There's no question at all. No. Okay. Then we're going to move on to another important key sector, the, uh, the leather. Um, obviously, they're going to explain to you where WIC is, and uh, after the presentation, you're going to realize the, um, what it does mean for a small city in the middle of a mountain without no, let's say, road and infrastructure. But there, uh, in there, they have really a long tradition, history, in terms of craftsmanship on how to work on leather. And uh, for instance, they are producing bags for the bottom, but for the rest, I leave it to, um, to Javier to explain what do you do in, your, in the Technological Institute and how you work with the city and with the region. Thank you. Uh, we prefer to talk in, in Spanish too because we have so short time, so uh, we decided to, to talk in Spanish. Uh, I use some videos that are in Spanish, but you can visit our website and you have in English and in French too, okay? So let me introduce you to Brique in, in one of these videos. <coughs> Ubrique es un pequeño pueblo blanco situado al sur de España, con una larga tradición en el sector de la marroquinería. Toda una serie de factores geográficos, climatológicos e históricos han contribuido a que en esta zona rural se concentre un importante número de empresas, conformando todo un clúster de la piel. El nivel de calidad que los talleres ofrecen gracias al know-how acumulado generación tras generación durante varios siglos es muy alto. Siendo esto uno de los factores, junto con la seguridad jurídica y la confidencialidad para atraer la atención de grandes casas de moda y operadores de lujo a nivel internacional. El sector se encuentra desde hace unos años inmerso en una profunda transformación para conseguir una mayor polivalencia y capacidad de reacción con los que mejorar el servicio que se ofrece a las marcas de moda y ampliar las posibilidades en cuanto a acabados que permitan a sus clientes adaptarse al cada vez más vertiginoso ritmo de las tendencias. En esta apuesta por la innovación que pueda posicionar a Ubrique como un verdadero referente en el mundo de la artesanía de vanguardia surge Modex, un centro que ofrece tecnología de vanguardia para la búsqueda de nuevos acabados. Así equipos formados por creativos, diseñadores y artesanos pueden encontrar varias estaciones de experimentación y trabajo en vuelo. Estación de impresión digital. Estación de bordado. Estación de lavado, tenido y secado. Estación de aceleración del envejecimiento. Estación de fresado. 
Estación de corte y perforados. Nuestro laboratorio se configura así como el lugar ideal para la realización de prototipos. Desde la idea al producto hay todo un desarrollo que pasa por la cooperación y el trabajo en equipo de profesionales con dilatada experiencia en el gremio. Desde patronistas a especialistas en cultura, montaje o acabados. Este proceso de desarrollo requiere de una perspectiva suficiente que permita medir el control y documentar el mismo, facilitando así a posteriori su producción en serie. Nosotros te ayudamos a encontrar el mejor equipo y a poner en marcha tu proyecto. Búsqueda, selección y contacto con los proveedores más adecuados para el proyecto. Búsqueda, selección y contacto de los artesanos que mejor se ajusten a cada proyecto. Coaching en la definición de la estructura de la colección. Coaching en el desarrollo de prototipos y muestras. Seguimiento y control de calidad en la fase de producción mediante la elaboración periódica de informes y análisis de las desviaciones conforme al acuerdo adoptado por el fabricante. Conferencias, cursos y jornadas teóricas y prácticas. Ubrique, sus maestros artesanos y la tecnología de Movex os esperamos para convertir en realidad vuestras ideas en piel. Estáis invitados. Eh, bueno, pues eh, Ubrique tiene una, una tradición de más de dos siglos eh, con la industria de la piel. Eh, hay todo un clúster con, con muchas pequeñas empresas, más de 100 empresas pequeñitas y unas 50 empresas de un tamaño un poco mayor, que producen para marcas sobre todo de, del mundo del, de la moda y en el sector del lujo. ¿no? Eh, marcas como Christian Dior, Chanel, La Croix, Louis Vuitton, eh, la mayoría francesa e inglesa, algunas americanas, algunas japonesas fabrican en Ubrique la, la parte de la colección de, eh, relacionada con la piel, ¿no? sobre todo bolso y pequeña marroquinería. En ese contexto, hace unos años, sufrimos la, una crisis importante y eh, muchas de estas marcas deslocalizaron la producción para irse a fabricar a países de fuera de la Unión Europea donde el coste de la mano de obra era mucho más económico. Entonces, en ese contexto nace Movex. ¿no? El significado de Movex indica un poco cuál es nuestro rol en la industria. Eh, la M de marroquinería, la M o de moda, porque el, el, el sector al que, con el que más nos relacionamos, aunque hay un proceso también de diversificación importante y se están trabajando en, otro, en otros campos. Eh, la M o V es de movimiento, porque nos parecía que había que salir de la artesanía tradicional e irnos hacia una artesanía de vanguardia donde eh, unir o, o, o uniendo a través del centro eh, todo ese saber hacer con las posibilidades que ofrecen la, las nuevas tecnologías. ¿no? Y eh, la EX de expansión. No podíamos hacer este proceso de cambio solo, sino teníamos que buscar socios y colaboradores de otra zona que aportaran eh, parte de los ingredientes necesarios para realizar esta transformación en la, en la industria local. ¿no? Eh, Movex tiene eh, dos edificios, ahora pondré también otro vídeo, donde eh, en uno de ellos realizamos las actividades propias de nuestra fundación, somos una fundación privada pero sin ánimo de lucro, donde están en su patronato las principales empresas del sector y también instituciones como el gobierno regional o el propio ayuntamiento de Ubrique, la universidad, eh, cámara de comercio, etc. Y eh, en el otro lo que hacemos es acoger empresas eh, que quieren iniciar su actividad en marroquinería, tanto de una forma, eh, digamos, permanente, durante tres años máximo, como de forma temporal. Aquellos diseñadores o creativos que vienen al pueblo por primera vez, pues pueden utilizar distintas salas, distintas zonas, para eh, realizar sus trabajos y, y encontrarse con los, con los artesanos. Esto, aunque parece sencillo, nos parecía fundamental para poder sacar de su contexto diario al artesano, al diseñador, y establecer un punto de encuentro, un lugar donde no se hablara el idioma ni de uno ni del otro, sino que fuese posible un poco el acercamiento de esos dos mundos, a principio tan antagonistas, el diseñador ve al artesano como alguien mayor, demasiado tradicional, demasiado ligado a la lentitud, y el, el, por el contrario el artesano ve al diseñador como alguien un poco loco, eh, demasiado relajado, con un ritmo vertiginoso, entonces nos parecía importante tener un espacio donde ambos se pudieran encontrar e iniciar esa, esa relación. Eh, mmm, los pasos que nosotros hemos seguido, aunque parecen también obvios, eran el primero trabajar la sensibilización, eh, la actitud era cerrada, porque a pesar de que habíamos sufrido esa crisis 
nunca se han ido todas las marcas y siempre ha habido un nivel de facturación importante en nuestra zona y mientras el resto de poblaciones de Andalucía sufrían mucho más los efectos de la crisis, en Ubrique pues, eh, no se notaba tanto y, y entonces pues, había que sensibilizar. ¿no? Lo que hicimos en un primer momento, en una primera fase, los dos primeros años fue intentar trabajar con las empresas que tenían una actitud más abierta al cambio e involucrarle en las distintas eh, proyectos, actividades que queríamos realizar para generar referentes de ese cambio. ¿vale? Estábamos hablando de pasar de talleres, donde simplemente se fabrica para casas de moda, a intentar conseguir artesanos que sean socios en proyectos de desarrollo de nuevos accesorios, no solo para la industria ya de la moda, sino para otros sectores. Eh, después de esta primera fase, de sensibilización, que hemos realizado actividades trayendo eh, referentes del mundo de la moda como revistas, diseñadores, empresas de cierto volumen para que eh, contaran su experiencia a nuestros artesanos locales, pues venía una fase de desarrollo en la que eh, intentamos que participaran empresas en grupo para que el miedo al riesgo y el, al cambio fuese menor, por lo cual pues intentábamos que en, en estos proyectos no, des, no, no participaran solo una empresa ni la sensibilizada, sino que hubiera mínimo tres, cinco empresas, algunas de las que ya habían participado en programas de sensibilización y otras que se unieran eh, siguiendo a estas. ¿no? Y por último, una etapa que después de diez años es la que nos encontramos ahora, que es la de promoción, para contar al resto del mundo lo que, lo que estaba pasando en, en Ubrique. ¿no? En la, en la primera eh, tuvimos muchas eh, barreras porque a la hora de seleccionar las empresas eh, no fue fácil. Algunas de ellas ponían bastante resistencia al cambio y eh, la forma eh, natural fue pues, la de sentarnos y dedicar mucho tiempo a hablar con ellos y a trasladar también un poco cuál era nuestra visión. ¿no? Por lo cual visitamos empresas no solo de nuestro sector, sino que lo que decidimos fue visitar empresas de otros sectores para que no se sintiesen eh, ofendidos, lastimados a la hora de decir creemos que tienes que cambiar ciertas cosas. ¿no? Además, se lo estábamos diciendo a gente que facturaban varios millones de euros al año en sus talleres. ¿no? Eh, al ver otros sectores, las transformaciones de otros sectores, la madera, la aeronáutica, que eh, visitamos talleres de, de tanto de España como de fuera de España, pues hubo más empresas receptivas a participar en el, en el cambio con nosotros. En, en la fase de desarrollo lo que hicimos fue crear esos grupos de trabajo y que nunca estuviesen formados solo por empresas locales ni solo por artesanos, sino que fuimos incluyendo figuras como las de ingenieros de producción, gestores de producción, eh, siempre pensando en que los cambios tuviesen una parte de negocio y que mm, consiguiese la empresa realmente un cambio, no solo en la organización o en la gestión de la empresa, sino en el resultado a final del año. ¿no? Si no había ese resultado a final del año, dejaban de participar al año siguiente. Eh, y en promoción, pues eh, lo que estamos intentando es eh, mantener a través de Internet eh, contacto continuo con ellos para que todo lo que vamos haciendo, participen o no en las actividades, lo conozca el resto del sector y de la ciudadanía en general del, del pueblo. ¿no? Empezamos con eh, 10 likes, 50 reproducciones y hoy en día los vídeos pues tienen... 3.000, 4.000, 5.000 reproducciones eh, en un par de días. ¿no? Eh, en cuanto a la incubadora eh, que os comentaba antes que tenemos como punto de, de encuentro, pues sí que la hemos dotado de tecnología, tanto de equipo como de, de programa, eh, para el diseñador, que sea útil para el diseñador como para los artesanos. Y en ese sentido, pues realizamos eh, cursos de formación, eh, workshops cortos para que puedan participar. Eh, hemos cambiado los formatos, lo hacemos todo muy dinámico y con espacios de tiempo muy cortos, pero continuos a lo largo del año, ¿vale? Para no empezar algo y no terminarlo, sino que viesen que éramos un aliado suyo eh, que venía para quedarse, ¿no? Que era medio y largo plazo. Eh, esos espacios son totalmente blancos, es un lienzo blanco para que surjan las ideas, ¿no? Para facilitar un poco que puedan surgir ideas, con lo cual, pues todo el edificio, todo el interior del edificio, está en colores muy neutros, ¿no? Os pongo un pequeño vídeo. I have a company based on the leather, leather industry right now. I based in Mobix, which has a very good um, structure and is very well located. 
I invite everyone to come here and in case you have any ideas, any business or anything that you might need, you can come here, you can find people that can help you to, to bring through your reality your dreams and they can also teach you how to go, what, um, what can you do, what's the best, do, that, what's the best thing that you can do to, to improve your ideas and your business. Eh, en cuanto a concepto y diseño, voy mucho más rápido, me quedan unas cuantas, lo hago muy rapidito. Eh, lo que hemos intentado es atraer el talento, ¿no? Colaboramos con varias escuelas de diseño, creo que hay alguien por aquí de Amberes, eh, con París, con la nueva escuela de París del Instituto de la Moda Francés, con el Instituto Europeo del Diseño, para que los diseñadores que utilizan de una manera más interesante la piel vengan hasta Ubrique, conozcan la, la industria en Ubrique y se establezcan lazos de unión que permitan colaboraciones, ¿no? En este caso he puesto en un, unas diapositivas de un diseñador español, de Palomo Stein, que es uno de los más conocidos ahora con más proyección internacional. La semana que viene presenta en Nueva York su colección y eh, los proyectos nacen desde eh, un diseño digital, eh, impresión 3D, pero luego participan eh, artesanos que son expertos en la manipulación del, del cuero, ¿no? Y utilizando técnicas como el macramé, que es típico del textil, pero que se realiza con hilo de cuero, ¿no? Eh, ahora mismo pues viste a Beyoncé, eh, a cantante eh, Rita Ora, a cantantes de nivel internacional. Eh, en cuanto a laboratorio, y así a corto y, y termino, pues lo que hemos intentado es que el laboratorio fuese un laboratorio eh, muy eh, enfocado al, a la industria local y al, y al negocio. ¿no? Cuando hablábamos en algunos proyectos de que para nosotros el laboratorio no era un espacio, sino que la principal fuente de información para nosotros es la calle, pues nos miraban con cara de extraño, ningún técnico de la administración nos apoyaba a la hora de dar ningún tipo de recurso y nos decía que estábamos un poco locos, pero nosotros no podíamos encerrar ese talento y esos artesanos en ningún espacio, sino que teníamos que mirar qué es lo que estaba pasando en la calle y qué es lo que está pidiendo el público de la calle. ¿no? Entonces lo que hacemos en el laboratorio ahora, en esta fase después de la previa de investigación en calle, es dotar de una serie de maquinaria como se habéis visto en el vídeo, eh, a facilitarla a un equipo donde se unen artesanos y diseñadores durante una semana, durante varias veces al año, y eh, vemos qué pasa. El, la, la, la única regla es que todo vale, que no vale decir no, y entonces salen ideas como lo que os voy a, a mostrar ahora. Es un, es un vídeo de una marca, de una joven diseñadora, de una escuela de diseño, eh, inspirado en la provincia de Cádiz. Tenemos mar y montaña y ella ha querido unir eh, el uso de las tecnologías para que el cliente final sepa cuál ha sido su motivo de inspiración, que es la naturaleza, qué maquinaria ha utilizado durante el proceso, cómo se ha obtenido el nivel de calidad de esos accesorios y que el, el cliente final entienda también un poco todo el trabajo que hay detrás de desarrollo de, detrás de un bolso. ¿no? Utiliza técnicas tradicionales como el armado y técnicas nuevas y, y tecnología para la impresión 3D como para la base de, de este bolso que estáis viendo. En el laboratorio se puede perforar la piel, imprimir sobre la piel, bordar la piel, incrustar cristal sobre la piel, envejecer la piel, marcarla. Y aquí tenéis algunas fotografías de algunos de los materiales que hemos, que hemos trabajado. ¿no? Y termino con un vídeo muy corto de un diseñador de Málaga que reside en Madrid que aprovechó los restos, una bolsa de sus productos industriales donde recogemos todos los residuos de las empresas y él a partir de ahí, eh, mezclándolo con una, con una resina, pues ha conseguido elaborar un material rígido para fabricar elementos de mobiliario, ¿vale? Y ahora colabora con, con Hermes, después de tres años. y lo que hice fue eh, desarrollar en colaboración con, con Movex y con, bueno, con todo el entorno de Ubrique un nuevo material que lo que hace es eh, coger todos los restos de producción de la industria de la piel 
eh, triturarlo, eh, mezclarlo con una, con una cola de hueso, eh, meterlo dentro de un molde y al final lo que saca una especie de listón. En vez de ser de madera, un listón de, de, de piel reciclado. Y con eso genero mobiliario, con eso hago muebles. Una de, la, de las cosas que me he dado cuenta que, que puede ser interesante intervenir es que eh, esto aparte de ser eh, un centro tecnológico en el que se trabaja para empresas, también se da formación. Y para mí la formación por la educación es fundamental. ¿vale? Entonces he encontrado una cosa que me parece muy interesante que es a los alumnos de, de los cursos de costura eh, le damos una especie de ejercicio. ¿vale? Para que empiezan a empezar, a empezar a coser y tal, primero coser en línea recta, después en círculo, después en triángulo, tal, tal, y al final es su primero en papel y después lo llevan a piel. Primero sin hilo y después con hilo. Entonces esa, esos trocitos, esos retales de piel que ellos empiezan a hacer ejercicio de línea, tirar línea recta, tirar círculo, no sé cuánto, al final generan un pattern súper interesante, que después si le sumas la capa del hilo, empiezan a generar una, una, un tema visual o estético súper interesante. Entonces me gustaría trabajar por ahí. No sé qué es lo que va a salir, pero me gustaría que, que la idea eh, empezase a trabajar por ahí. Simplemente para despedirnos, deciros que nos pusimos un plazo de 10 años para las primeras fases, que estamos ahora en esos 10 años y que creemos que los proyectos deben ir siempre, eh, nosotros como centro, como instituciones, un par de pasos por delante de lo que realmente eh, la industria local necesita para poder realmente ser útiles para, para ellos. Gracias. Javier por esta, por esta presentación y sobre todo por haber explicado lo que hace un sector, un sector y la revolución de un sector y cómo habéis trabajado mano a mano con, el, con, la, con las autoridades locales. Y just going to move on uh, para, uh, for the very last, uh, very last um, uh, panelist in here is the, uh, la alcaldesa Rodríguez, Isabel Gómez García. And, um, Isabel, we, uh, nos gustaría saber ¿Cómo ha sido trabajar primero con, con, con Mubes y al mismo tiempo qué iniciativas tenéis dentro de la, del municipio para lo que es la digitalización? Muy bien, gracias Piedad. Bueno, en primer lugar, eh, felicitar tanto a la Comisión Europea como a la FAN, no puedo dejar de reconocer lo que nos permite ¿no? a estar hoy aquí. Y también felicitar a Gesira, al Ayuntamiento de Azarcarde, pues por el trabajo también que está haciendo como ciudad tecnológica. Eh, desde Ubrique, nuestra historia y nuestra esencia, hablar de Ubrique es decir que Ubrique es piel de Ubrique, no tiene otro secreto. Y nosotros desde el ámbito municipal, desde las instituciones, en este caso del ayuntamiento, eh, lo que hacemos continuamente es trabajar con todos los agentes del sector para la parte que podamos impulsar, no solo de, de conocimiento y difusión de, de Ubrique, de las oportunidades que pueden ofrecer económicamente a todo un tejido empresarial, sino también para enfatizar en nuestra cultura, en nuestra forma de entender la vida, que creemos que también es un valor considerable. Nosotros, eh, con el Centro Tecnológico, tenemos una oportunidad que no existiría. Yo no soy capaz de imaginar el presente de, de Ubrique sin que hubiera aparecido el Centro Tecnológico de la Piel de Andalucía en nuestra localidad, porque la, bueno, pues la producción, la fabricación de, de productos eh, marroquineros, en este caso de, de productos fabricados en piel, pues requieren un alto porcentaje de mano de obra, como bien saben, es una fabricación artesanal, pero que complementado con la tecnología y con la innovación permite no solo modernizar los procedimientos de fabricación, haciéndolo mucho más viable, sino también el, el, la necesidad de adaptarnos al mundo en el, en el que nos movemos. Creo que, que estas jornadas mmm, demuestran que la, lo que inicialmente las nuevas tecnologías parecía que nos estaban dotando ¿no? a una nueva herramienta, instrumento para la gestión diaria, lo que hoy no, no cabe duda que eh, ha supuesto pues una, manera, una nueva manera de relacionarnos, de comunicarnos y, y como no también de, que ha supuesto un cambio tanto cultural como social y, y económico. Y en ese aspecto el, el Ayuntamiento de Ubrique siempre intenta estar a la vanguardia con, con Ubrique. Ubrique, como bien eh, Piedra presentaba, y ya también hemos podido comprobar eh, a través del vídeo de Javier, eh, Ubrique se encuentra al sur de Andalucía, al sur de, de Europa, un municipio con 16.615 habitantes aproximadamente en este 2018. Se encuentra enclavado entre dos parques naturales, el Parque Natural Sierra de Grazanema y el Parque Natural de los Arcos Locales y tenemos un término muy pequeño para la dimensión del sector que está 
eh, de la dimensión que está cogiendo el centro de la piel. Tenemos un término de 72 kilómetros cuadrados y que además está en un alto porcentaje pues protegido por la eh, influencia de los parques naturales, que es otro valor ambiental. Nos situamos en una comarca, en la comarca de la Sierra de Cádiz, que compone lo, los pueblos de, de la ruta de los pueblos blancos, 19 municipios donde solo hay uno que supere la, la población de 20.000 habitantes y es una comarca especialmente volcada en la, en la industria agroalimentaria y Ubrique es verdad que ha permitido a, a la Sierra de Cádiz incorporar una actividad económica centenaria, como decía Javier, estamos hablando de que en el siglo XVIII se estaba ya fabricando piel en, en, en Ubrique y, y ha permitido, como digo, pues ofrecer otras oportunidades económicas a la, a la Sierra de Cádiz. Dentro de la, yo no quisiera tampoco extenderme demasiado, pero que dentro de la, de la importancia que muchas veces eh, tiene la incorporación de la tecnología, que todos somos conscientes, pero yo quisiera enfatizar que muchas veces los municipios pequeños, los de media dimensión, los menos de 20.000 habitantes, también por la ubicación donde nos encontramos, pues se nos dificulta un poco todo más, se nos dificulta todo un poco más. Por ejemplo, cuando hablamos de fibra óptica o cuando hablamos de implantación y de proyectos que van facilitando la, la red, la velocidad, lo que todos eh, necesitamos, pues va llegando algo mucho más lentamente a, a estos municipios y dentro de esas dificultades intentamos ¿no? de, de actualizarnos y, y de aprovechar todo ese contexto digital que tanta importancia tiene. Desde el ámbito municipal, yo sí me gustaría compartir con, vos, con vosotros y vosotras varios ejemplos que, que creo que visualizan lo que es la apuesta también de, de nuestros pueblos por incorporarnos y no quedarnos atrás en esta vanguardia tecnológica. Y, y tenemos también un marco normativo que nos ha obligado a ponernos la, las pilas en los ayuntamientos, como es la nueva ley de procedimiento administrativo, y que es la contratación electrónica, donde ahora cualquier empresa en el territorio nacional puede estar presente en un expediente de contratación de, de los ayuntamientos con toda esa vorágine e incorporación ¿no? de, de nuevos procedimientos eh, también digitales y telemáticos en la, en la administración o como fue la ley de transparencia que todavía estamos poniéndonos al día que permite comunicarse, ¿no? lo que decimos, la, la importancia de comunicarnos actualmente con las oportunidades que tenemos con nuestra ciudadanía y la ley de transparencia pues permite al ciudadano, a cualquier persona o entidad interesada en conocer los cientos de documentos que llevamos ya colgados en el portal de transparencia de, del ayuntamiento con un esfuerzo extraordinario tanto del equipo técnico como también del jurídico y facilitar aquella información que nos encuentre en este portal a cualquier persona que lo solicite en un tiempo regulado y que estamos obligados a proporcionarlo, algo que hace un tiempo parecía inconcebible y más, eh, como digo, en los, en los municipios más del mundo rural. Luego sí quisiera compartir con vosotros la Administración Electrónica, que también fue un acierto por parte del Ayuntamiento porque permite pues, estar en casa, lo que eh, también han manifestado. Eh, y, por cierto, que estoy muy contenta y orgullosa de compartir mesa con, con todos los que me han cedido la palabra. Y, y como comentábamos, estar en tu casa y poder comunicarte con la Administración, que no tiene cierre, no cierra las puertas ninguna hora y continuamente podemos estar dirigiéndonos a ella. Pero hay un par de programas que nosotros hemos implantado hace muy poco tiempo que sí me parecen importantes, que están a, la, a una vanguardia dentro de la concepción y contextualización de, de lo que estoy compartiendo con vosotros. Y es la, la oportunidad que, que supone mmm, nosotros en el 2017, si no recuerdo mal, nos lanzamos a, para ponerle allá en funcionamiento y, y al ciudadano una aplicación eh, de incidencias en el municipio se llama Mejor Aurique, se descarga perfectamente a través de la aplicación en el móvil eh, y entonces permite que cualquier persona, ciudadano, vecino, a través de esa descarga pues pueda fotografiar bien a través de, de normalmente las incidencias y perdonad en ese aspecto que teníamos una presentación pero no hemos podido cargarla, pero eh, venía a reforzar ¿no? lo que estoy comentando con datos estadísticos y lo que ha permitido que la gente en vez de tener que ir al ayuntamiento como tradicionalmente a presentar una instancia donde tienes que perder tu tiempo y hacerlo oficialmente, pues ahora a través del móvil se echa la fotografía tanto del socavón si hay el, el caso, eh, una farola fundida, una baranda caída, en fin, cualquier incidencia que nos encontramos en la rutina, en el día de, de nuestras calles y de nuestros inmuebles, pues permite al ciudadano comunicarlo formalmente al ayuntamiento 
optimizando también eh, lo que son los recursos públicos para atender ¿no? a estas necesidades e incluso poder anticiparnos a todas las necesidades, tanto de materiales como de personal, para abordarlo. Y yo os puedo asegurar día de hoy que permite un ahorro y una optimización de los recursos que tan debidos también estamos. Y, y para terminar, bueno, también incorporamos en este mandato una aplicación de gestión de expediente administrativo, que estoy contentísima. Yo he estado aquí firmando desde el móvil pues todo el, el diario de, de los expedientes que se están haciendo en el ayuntamiento, que hace un tiempo, como digo, pues parecía algo difícil. Y termino con un programa del que me siento especialmente eh, eh, satisfecha, eh, el punto y hora de las oportunidades que está sufriendo la, a la población ubriqueña. Como decía Bien Piedad, eh, nosotros eh, todavía en la comarca, ¿no? en, lo, en el mundo rural, tenemos que hablar de alfabetización digital, lo que en la ciudad es algo menos difícil o porque la gente está continuamente en contacto con esa tecnología, es verdad que en los, en los municipios tenemos que volcarnos para facilitar el, esos nuevos instrumentos y esa nueva eh, forma de comunicarnos y de estar en el mundo pues a, a determinados colectivos especialmente, a los mayores y, y a los jóvenes, ¿no? que, que son el, el presente y futuro. Y tenemos varios programas de alfabetización en el Centro de Participación Activa de, del municipio para poder eh, enseñar a, y formar y, y, y dotar a, a nuestros mayores para que se puedan desenvolver con, con toda la de, frescura que ellos tienen en, en el mundo de hoy y, y también a, a los jóvenes. Y existe un programa que descubrimos en el 2015, en otoño de 2015, que se llama Ciudad Ciencia, al que de verdad... Eh, no paro de regalarle eh, el oído porque es un programa magnífico de la divulgación de la tecnología y de la investigación. Eh, está concebido, bueno, eh, se trata de un programa divulgativo que dirige el Centro Superior de Investiga el Consejo Superior de Investigaciones Científicas, que es el consejo donde engloba eh, un elenco de profesionales científicos eh, en, en España. Está abanderado también por la… Eh, recientemente la Caixa era la que eh, financiaba eh, este programa y ahora se ha incorporado eh, desde el 2018 la Fundación Española para la Ciencia y la Tecnología y viene respaldado también por el Ministerio de Ciencia, Innovación y Universidades del Gobierno de España. Nos permite en Cádiz, en la provincia de Cádiz, como bien saben que, que estamos, eh, Ubrique fue el segundo municipio que se adhirió al programa Ciudad Ciencia, en Andalucía fuimos el quinto y hay en torno a 40, 40, algo más de 40 municipios adheridos en todo el ámbito nacional y os puedo asegurar que para nuestro pueblo está suponiendo una oportunidad de acercamiento de toda la tecnología, de todo el conocimiento científico, cultura, la cultura en general a nuestra gente de, en un lenguaje adaptado que son unos grandes profesionales a, al público al que va dirigido. Así que también me quería hoy eh, compartir con vosotros ese gran programa para que tengáis conocimiento. Yo nada más, eh, las horas que, que nos ha tocado, que muchas gracias a los que estáis ahí sentados porque son horas en las que debéis estar también ya cansados después de todo el día y, y muchas gracias por vuestra atención y ni que deciros que estáis todos y todas invitados a, a venir a Ubrique a conocernos y conocer la, la piel de Ubrique. El Centro Tecnológico seguirá estando y ofreciendo la vanguardia al sector, se están notando los resultados y creo que, que Ubrique, centro de producción mundial, de la mejor calidad, eh, del mejor eh, producto de piel eh, en calidad y, y bueno, reiterar eh, bueno, mi invitación, la, nuestra invitación a que vayáis a conocerlo. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. With this note of marketing, uh, of marketing city, so if, if we have a presentation how to market your city, so I think we have a mayor here doing that. So yeah, you know. So uh, thank you so much, and I think that honestly, unless there's a very burning issue, um, I, we are really very tired, all of us, and I think that. Um, I could say that this uh, this session is concluded, and let's get to the to the very quick next one. So, Electra, I think that you're going to introduce it, and a big round of uh, applause again to this panel. Thank you.
Luis, Creo que me dejaron una bolsa por ahí. No sé dónde. Aquí viene. Hay una, una negra. No hay nada ahí, ¿no? Ah, pues lo habrán cogido ella, seguro. Ni debajo de la mesa. ¿No? Qué raro, ¿eh? Thank you for coming. It's a big pleasure to be here in order to introduce the Circular Lab. It's an initiative launched by Ecoembes in 2017. Uh, I don't know if you know who, uh, what is Ecoembes. Ecoembes is the organization that cares uh, the environment uh, through eco design and recycling. Uh, of packaging in Spain. We are the only organization that in charge of that in Spain. We launched the Circular Lab, it's a real scale laboratory uh, where we test different uh, innovative solutions uh, regarding the eco design or uh, recycling of packaging. Uh, we work in four different strategic lines, smart ways, eco design, citizen sign and enterprises. Uh, we, the main feature here, uh, we, we want to create uh, 40 jobs in, in the circular lab. We, uh, we plan to invest more or less 10 uh, million euros uh, during the next four years. And we want to create a, a, an ecosystem there with different startup and enterprises uh, in order to collaborate with the citizen in Spain, okay? Uh, smart ways. Smart ways uh, is our first strategic line. It's a technology platform uh, oriented to improve the municipal waste services. Okay, we create this technology platform. It's ready, and the idea with this technology platform is to help the public agencies, the organization. Uh, in charge of uh, waste uh, management, the municipalities and uh, the city council, uh, to improve the quality of the services in terms of cost saving and uh, improve the, the increase the, the collection rate. Okay, 
Uh, we want to, to, to improve the environmental performance uh, through the transport optimization. The, the pla uh, this platform let you to improve the, the transport of the waste uh, uh, inside the cities or the municipalities. And we want to improve the communication with the citizens. This is the train target of this platform. And we are, we are doing several pilot projects. It's a platform that is uh, now ready, more or less. We are doing the zone amendment or some different aspect of the, of the technology platform. But now we are working with the city council in Logroño with the, not only in the capital, with the whole region, is a large region in Spain, and we are trying to improve the, the, the municipal waste uh, collection services uh, there in Logroño, and with Sun Island, for example, we are working with one of the Canarian Island, and uh, with Cantabria region, we are di uh, doing different pilot projects, okay? Uh, if you need more information about this technology platform, I will bring some leaflet and I can give you some information about the, the platform. Eco design. Uh, we create in the Circular Lab a, an eco design tool to quantify and to assess uh, the influential parameters uh, to design packaging. For us, uh, it's important to have this tool because we give this tool to the producer in order to minimize the environmental impact of the packaging. We create this, uh, this tool with different institutions, from Hofer, uh, several uh, technological institutions in, in Spain, the University of Catalonia, and we eco are involved in the partnership. Okay? This uh, tool is ready to, to be used, uh, the software is designed and we are doing some, uh, some tests at sectorial level and um, we plan to, to diffuse as much as possible uh, to be used by the producer of packaging. Uh, another initiative in, in EcoDesign is the observatory. We create an observatory, Packaging of Future is the name of this observatory. We uh, analyze uh, the legislation, the production processes, um, the new material, the technology trends, in order to uh, find new ways of collaborate and create new projects. We are open to, to create partnership and to innovate as much as possible in packaging processes. Okay? Um, another strategic line, uh, and for me it's quite interesting this one, is the citizen sign. We work with, uh, we have a lot of data, taking in consideration that we, are, we collect data uh, um, from all the cities in Spain, 8,000 cities. We have all the data about uh, collection rates and recycling. And we collect this data and we try to analyze this data and to find different trends uh, in order to design our communication campaigns. We launched the last year more or less 300 different communication campaigns at different level, at national level, at regional level, at local level. So we have a huge experience on that and we are trying to get uh, data in order to, do the, um, to have more impact in our communication campaign. Another interesting thing, for, uh, this is very, very recent, is the chatbot. We create a chatbot to facilitate um, the citizen uh, the information to be part of the um, recycling process. This chatbot is available online and you can ask every question that, in order, um, every question about the recycling process in order to know uh, what kind of packaging you have to introduce in the container. And it's uh, very easy because uh, all the citizens have doubts uh, this packaging is in this container or not and it's very interactive and it's uh, online. Okay, uh, last strategic line uh, is the enter uh, entrepreneurship. We create two different types of cooperation. Mm -hmm. One is the Circular Talent Lab. This is for young people. We launch a challenge to the, these uh, young people. The, uh, the, uh, we work in groups, more or less to 20, 10 to 20 people working together. And we launch a challenge and they have to solve the situation under this challenge 
for example, uh, last year we uh, the challenge was to create a new container, a smart container, intelligent container, and they produce very interesting product that is ready for the market. Um, they are happy because they start to work and they have experience in the way to work and produce new new projects. Uh, sorry, last uh, slide I think. Uh, the, the cooperation with Enterprise, uh, we work with people who want to launch a new company and um, we provide uh, financial aids and we give support uh, in our installation in order to launch the company and the most important thing we are the first client of the startups so if you work with us and you uh, you join the program that we have we are our first year so uh, here you have the result uh, eight startup um, in 2017 and now we are closing the result of the year uh, more or less uh, 10 to 12 uh, startups uh, now they are we are very happy and we are looking new opportunities to be hosted there in the circular lab these are some pictures of the circular labs um, it's a very innovative place and we are more than happy to to receive visit um, and there you have the contact uh, information in order to, to organize these visits. Okay, thank you for everything. Thank you very much, Victor. One more invitation for visit uh, today. Uh, we continue with Enric Opoaprieto from MOX. Uh, MOX is a service provider uh, to maximize production capacity of companies. I am the Chief Operating Officer in MOX um, and I'm going to be sharing with you our thoughts of the current situation of the, sh of the marketplace, of the, um, of the sector in this case and we will try to share with you our thoughts about the future of this, of this sector. So first, who are we? Um, we are a logistics provider for companies and private individuals. We are very focused on last mile delivery, although we have um, pivoted to other you know, um, ways of doing business. But that we are experts in the last mile delivery. That means um, shops, co big companies, and food delivery. And what we do to our clients is maximizing their online sales by adding this added <coughs> value, if you let me the, the um, addition of the word. And we, as I said, we are instant delivery experts for city of all sizes. What does it mean? That means that we we are able to expand our business in Barcelona and in Utrera, in shows. So what's our client's goal? Our client's goal is to create a local strong commercial activity and increase the market share. If we work with you, you're going to increase your sales, that's for sure, okay? <laughs> Next, these are some numbers. I'm not going to, to, you know, to repeat how amazing we are, but the most important thing here is that we, we know that most of our customers, most of the people that want things to be delivered, they want the things ASAP. That means now. It doesn't mean tomorrow, it doesn't mean the next day. This is the old fashioned way of doing things. We want things now. We live in the Instagram stories, you know, society and we are like little kids that we, we want to deliver things at the moment, no? Um, but the most important thing I would like to share with you in this in this context, um, we believe in sustainable logistics. What does it mean? It means that we try to promote um, electric vehicles. We would love to work with, you know, um, this kind of motorbikes that you um, charge in your in your in your own stores. We would like to work also with um, patinetes. Mm -hmm. You know the word for that, patin eléctrico. But you know the local restrictions are mm, so so, and we would we would like to to do some um, some strengths, no, to to use this kind of, of vehicles. But at the moment, it's not possible. Also, some of our data, we currently work in 43 Spanish cities. You don't have here the north, 
because the map has been moved, but we are also working in the north of Spain, okay? We're working in Bilbao, Santander, Coruña, Vigo. Um, we have more than 1,000 bikers. That means that this is a lot of people, a lot of families working with us, um, a lot of, um, you know, money we're spending on them. But we're very happy to, to, to say so because this is our eighth failure. You know how the sector is now, you know how the bad news are being shared about global, about delivery, all these kind of, of, of you know problems they have with autonomous workers. We we don't we don't believe in that. We think that it's possible to you know to contract people. It is if you can do the numbers. Also, we have more than 750 partners, and we promote, as I said, sustainable mobility because our workers, most of them, not all, not all of them, but most of them, they use electric motorcycles. We have some motor providers, um, and they are very happy with us. Next. Some of our clients, um, I've been talking with some of you before. You know some of them, Justy, Duberi, Seur, Celeris, which is, uh, it belongs to Telefonica, Pestalia, Fnac. Um, in future, sure, more will come, but these are the, the most important ones nowadays. These are the cities that we're working now. Um, just uh, to repeat, we are also working on, on the north of Spain, and we're very happy to, to to share with you that this next March we're going to Italy, um, the 15th of March, which is great. I don't speak Italian, so we'll have to. And <laughs> also we're going to Mexico. I don't like um, spicy food, but I will have to eat it. And we're very happy to share that with you because this was um, at to the presentation um, two days ago. That's why I updated it. <laughs> now it's official, I can share it with you. And so this is the thing that I, I wanted to share with you because here we're talking about the smart cities now, sustainability. And let's see, what's the role of the city nowadays, no? What's the role of the city? What, what's going on? The main, the main problem here is that there are too many stakeholders involved. Um, we have policymakers, we have companies, we have local governments, have shared interest, interest but we, ha we also have interests that are being um, confronted. People don't want to give, and some others don't want to, you know, to recognize that some policies have to be done, etc. There is a lack also of urban planning, um, infrastructure and adaptation to technology. The Internet of Things is something that will come, for sure. Not today, not tomorrow, but it will come. Um, also, we believe that cities are express delivery friendly. That means that if I want to go from McDonald's to to two streets, you know, just in front of that, um, I can go. There is no problem on, on that. But the human frenzy raises cost and it's time consuming. Um, if you have experienced troubles in Amazon, it's okay because um, it always happens. I mean, you, know, you ask for something today, it's going to be here tomorrow, but it, it's not going to happen because there are all these situations that cannot be controlled because cities are not interconnected. You see the point. So common problems we have because um, of the lack of the Internet of Things thing, that we have unnamed roads, we have uh, scarcity of parking, and we have lack of unloading areas. Um, I'm from Barcelona and I know what I'm talking about. Um, we have um, a lot of troubles in terms of, just to, 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 to put an example, lack of un unloading areas. Is I'm, if I'm going to unload something on, on a store and then the police comes and they find me, they feel me, that's, that's going to be a trouble. No, it's going to raise my cost. And also we have um, the obvious, no? the urban chaos, demonstrations, closed streets, traffic jams, and the taxi. <laughs> it's Madrid and Barcelona, some troubles. And the last thing um, about today's role of the city is that um, the regulation, as I said in the first point, depends on several factors that cannot be controlled by the company, by us. We have to adapt. Oops, sorry. We have to adapt. To what? To the vehicle size, to the fuel type, to the emission factor, to the hours of operation, to the movement permit. Too many things out of our control. So the challenge, no? Um, main challenge is that today, thanks to some local um, policies, there is a great promotion of clean cities, of less pollution, safer streets for pedestrians, sustainable mobility, and public transport. Um, as I said, I'm from Barcelona, and this point there is being um, applied in the everyday. Um, societies have to adapt to that, but if we can educate you know, our customers, I believe policy makers can educate no, their customers, which is the society, the citizens. Um, Something, some, some data I would like to share with you that last mile delivery comprises 33% of the total cost of shipping in our case. If we can reduce this cost uh, for, as a company, the client will be um, purchasing our, our products no? in, in a more um, cheap way, in cheaper way. And also, current model relies too much on independent courier networks 
and call centers. That means that we do not let the machine work. We don't trust. Um, it's okay, you know, to to believe in your gut, and you know, this is going to happen because I think my experience says. But you know, if we have the, the technology as we do have in Mox, why don't to trust the technology? You know? And thanks to the clean last night in Europe and the UFT, um, we are sure that this will influence policymakers you know, <coughs> towards to a sustainable um, governance model by improving the quality of service, by reducing cost, and all of the points that I said in the first in the first um, sentence: you know? clean cities, less pollution, etc. So, what is the future? I don't know, but <coughs> I can tell you the highlights of it. <laughs> so we know the machine learning software we, it's, it's a reality today. It's happening, and we have to adapt to it. And we sh we will have to learn to let the machine do the work. This is something that the sooner we, we get it, the sooner it's going to be better for us. Then we are going to be very worried about algorithms and analytics. We are going to move from prediction no? to, to, to knowing what you're going to buy. I know you're going to buy the next U2 uh, album because I know what you're going to do, so I'm going to send you the promotion. I know that you're going to be asking for a hamburger this Friday because I know that when Barcelona plays, you're going to, play, you're going to buy this hamburger, so I'm going to send it to you. And also, very important, we're going to have the dynamic routine, multi-pickup and multi-drop-up. What does it mean? It means that um, I'm going to be able to put inside my box more things because I'm going to have better routes. Um, I'm going to optimize that, less costs. Um, I think we're going to be able to, to promote the courier collaboration. The, the, the person that is delivering things to you is going to be in a conversation with you as a customer to say, hey, which route do you think is the best one? Um, do you think this is okay? The customer is going to be able to, to talk to you. This is going to, um, to, to make a better, the, the service a, a, a better thing. Um, also, we are going to be working nowadays. We have some tests with proof of delivery tools, with Teleris and um, Telefonica. We have this proof of delivery tools, but they are not, um, let's say, modern enough. Modern, okay. So working on that is going to um, to decrease. Is going to make the, the cost decrease. Um, also, what I said about the collaboration in time delivery following. Um, if you ask, if you ask, I'm sorry, if you order something for through Global, for instance you can see your courier coming to your house. This gamification thing, this um, bi-directional communication with the courier is going to be a reality. Um, you're going to be able to talk to the courier and he's going to deliver for you, for you the best, the, he's going to, ch to choose the best way to, to your house, okay? Yeah, this is the last one. <laughs> and the future, okay, last thing. Um, we're going to be able to load and deliver more goods for travel. We're going to develop freight protocols corridors to concentrate shipments. We are going to consolidate the store model. That means that I'm not going to be always picking things from the same place or the same places. Because for instance, if I am buying something for Corte Inglés, um, there is one Corte Inglés per city. But if I'm go going to buy something from FNAC, there are many FNACs per city. No? So if we implement the store model, we're going to be able to take things from one only place. And also the that kitchen food for food delivery. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that means that there is a big building with a lot of kitchens from different restaurants. That's a lot of cost reducing things. And to, to sum up, um, I think I would like to highlight the most is the increased investment on data creation analysis. Um, this is the future. And the consequence of that is that the companies' roles are going to be a lot more positive because the less couriers you need to do things, the less stores you need to, to go to pick up things, the more benefits you're going to get from that. And that's all for me. Mm -hmm. This is my email if you want to talk to me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, the last but not least, uh, Luis Garcia Milan, one year astronaut, a case of talent returning home. And uh, he's going to, <laughs> to show us Sol Galaxy that provides uh, tools to digitalize pro processes and manuals. Sorry. Okay, so Sol Galaxy, this is the, the company I, I'm, I'm CEO of. Uh, as you can see, we are spinning off of the University of Jaén so, and uh, the European Space Agency. We've made something incredible, we've put together 
to big entities, to big public entities, to work in something that will change the world. I really say that, I really believe that. We are gonna make something incredible. We are, I, I'll tell you after. Uh, when I say we, it's because we are a team. Uh, we are a balanced team. Uh, you have me, which is the crazy entrepreneur. Uh, I worked two years for the European Space Agency in the European Astronaut Center in Cologne, in Germany. I met uh, many astronauts from Italy, from France, from Germany. Uh, the Spanish one that now is a minister, for example. And we have uh, Jose Manuel and Juan Carlos, which are uh, professors from my university, telecommunication professors. And we have Salvador, which is there. Please say something. <laughs> uh, he's the old guy uh, saying how to do things right, how to make things happen. He has uh, experience in Telefonica for 10 years as a, as a boss, a big boss. So, I mean, uh, he's helping a lot with the management uh, of the company. We're a startup, we just got born. And the impressive picture. So, here you have astronauts on the International Space Station. They are floating the Earth 4, 000, 400 kilometers, 8 uh, kilometers per second speed. But they are using procedures in paper. What's wrong there? I mean, you are in a super technological world, but you are using papers? Really? For checking procedures, for doing every kind of task. So I get, uh, I arrive to Cologne, to the European Astronaut Center, and I make this. Uh, this is uh, the German astronaut Alexander Guest, and I give him an app in an Android. I put the procedure uh, inside the, the smartphone, and he can work uh, in an interactive way, in a digital way. He's in contact with Earth. So I make something that is really boring, a PDF. Something that is really funny, uh, an app, uh, an Android app, uh, that which you can use, you can learn, you can see images, you can see videos, you learn in a really interactive way, or you work connected. You don't need any, a paper anymore, you don't need a PDF anymore, nobody likes to read a PDF. This is boring. So we make things uh, really, really easy. So Smart PV, this is the product, Smart Procedure Viewer. And it's a, oh my God, I, you can see it probably. Smart Procedure Viewer, a technology of a space origin. So we took uh, this app that we put uh, on the International Space Station and we want to transfer it to uh, cities, to industry, to companies, to whatever person or institution that needs to have a procedure. So everyone, at the end you go, uh, even my grandma to send me the kitchen recipes can use the app because it's really easy. So this is the point. Uh, we all agree that procedures are needed for everything, uh, but we have them in folders in a corner, so full of dust. Uh, nobody reads them. Uh, at the end, you have a lot of errors because nobody reads them, so they don't know how to make things work, uh, right. And um, well, you need them to produce more, to have more qualities, so at the end, it's a mess, and it's something that is a big problem in many places. What we offer, and uh, we offer a digital solutions, collaboration, cloud, which is very important. So all, all the data is in the cloud. You can access from every part of the world using the smartphone. You are connected. Uh, multimedia files and statistics. You learn from what you do. You are following the procedure. So you know how much time you get, you, you need to do one step, how much time you, it took for a person to make any kind of task. We learn from that, so we can improve your processes as well. So, uh, this is us. Uh, as I said, ISA, we are in now being incubated in the European Space Science Business Incubator Center <laughs> of Comunidad de Madrid. Uh, we are spin off of University of Jaén. We also uh, receive help from SECOT, which Salvador Binons is a, a association of uh, senior uh, senior business people, which are retired and now help uh, young people. You have there the uh, German astronaut Matthias Maurer. Actually, if you go to Sol Galaxy YouTube channel, we have a two minutes video of him saying how amazing is our product. So he's helping us from the from from space, let's say. And we also have some public institution as Diputación Orcade. So uh, we've uh, we've made a lot to help to have uh, many companions during our trip. So, uh, what is different for us? Uh, ob obviously, we are offering a product that is being used in space. Uh, so you have quality. You have something that works. If you fail in space, you die. 
So uh, we are offering uh, no errors, quality, and really easy. Of course, we have NASA behind. Uh, this product has been tested by NASA, proved by NASA, and ESA. Now moving into cities, what can we offer to cities? So uh, all cities have uh, service management, uh, for example, for transport. There is a company that is uh, in charge of transport, another from, for waste. So how do you control that they work in the exact way you want? So probably you have procedures that tell them how to do things, but what if at the same time they are working, they are generating files that you can check lately. You, they can have their smartphone uh, working and they are generating data, GPS, uh, Bluetooth, uh, messages, pictures, even pictures, that you can then analyze and check, okay, they did a great job. The same with uh, water supply, electricity supply, if you have to do a maintenance, you can have all the manuals in, in, the, in, the, in the same way. So if you have to repair something and you are not an expert, you just download the manual, uh, you, see, you watch a funny video of it, and then you, you know how to do things. Tourists and images. Imagine that uh, you receive people in your city, they want to do a tour around the city, and you have the manual that tells them. First, you have to go there. Then you have to go there. Here, you have a video of an explanation of this monument. Here you can uh, do whatever, and you, uh, you are guiding them through uh, space technology. That is the point. So this is the image thing. You are offering a solution that is from space. It's being validated by NASA. And this increased your, your image as, as a technological city. And of course, internal management. These all boring procedures that you have in your database, uh, nobody reads, but you can also work on that. Um, uh, the last one, uh, benefits for the smart cities. At the end, uh, you are saving time and money in all the processes because you are making the things as they have to be done. You can control and then you can offer transparency because everything, everything your people did is on the website. Then you can decide if you make it public or not or what you make public. You increase the efficiency because people work the sad way the procedure says, so and the procedure is quality. Uh, again, the image improvement, you are working with a NASA technology. And statistics, uh, who works better, who is better for what task, or I mean, how many people downloaded what procedure because they were visiting the cathedral. So how many people visited the cathedral using the app? Well, this is us, smart procedure review. How are we with time? Ah, so we are, we are perfect. Uh, you can contact us in info at uh, solgalaxy.com. Uh, you can find us on LinkedIn if you want to send us an email or whatever. We can visit the city. We can, uh, do, we can do a free demo. And I will use the last minute, please, to take a selfie. Because uh, <laughs> we, we work online. We, we need the cloud for this. So I will try to, can we yes. be together? <laughs> Okay, okay, three, two, one. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, amazing. Thank you, all three. It was <laughs> an amazing end to this academy. Uh, please, one very loud round of applause for the three of them before we pass it down. <laughs>
but uh, what is mission possible is to at least remind a few of my personal impressions and a few of the next steps that are, they are in the agenda. And then I will uh, give the ball back to you. So one thing that I retain is that by now, Digital City Challenge is a brand name and it is a community. A community, a network of these 40 cities that you are here today and others that were following through the webcasting. So already this for me is an achievement. If you consider that most of you, uh, you are not the capitals in your country, you are small to medium cities that perhaps never had this networking opportunity. So constructing this community is already an achievement by itself. Uh, second, it helps you to create these quattro helix communities in your cities. Quattro means uh, the city, the municipality, academia, businesses, but also the civil community. Uh, we understand from the strategies, from the discussions, that this uh, is advancing very well. Of course, the challenge, there are challenges, I will come to the challenges as well. So this is already an achievement I retain and I'm, we are very happy about that. There is great momentum. We experience a great momentum over those two days. We experience a lot of bilaterals, trilaterals, multilaterals, as you are now very much in the phase that you have thought through your strategy, your ambitions, your strategy, and you are already in the reflection of the implementation, which means where shall I get the money to implement my strategies? Uh, so this academy helped a lot to provide some information, some links, some very good examples from cities who are perhaps one, two steps ahead. Uh, so the uh, onus is now back to you to reflect what will be winning partnerships for you to reflect and uh, submit proposals for funding for particular specific items of, um, of your interest. Uh, which brings me to the next steps. Uh, indeed, next steps is now pretty much, especially for the wave one cities, maturing from the shaping of strategies and roadmaps to the implementation. We, uh, the European Commission, with the ASME, we can facilitate that. We are very happy to facilitate that. In, uh, in the sense that there was a huge interest though over those two days from different cities on the URBAT uh, project, uh, program that was presented yesterday we can sh send us the ideas that you have that, uh, that you would like to share with other cities and we will be happy to share that with everybody in order to create connections. Then, once the connections are made, of course, it will be up to you to complete your proposals and submit your proposals and uh, with all your support, I believe you will be you know, very good candidates for funding. Uh, but also other partnerships. The smart specialization partnership for industrial modernization is another opportunity, more medium to long term, of course, but we would be very happy to start seeing now partnerships like this. This will be very concrete results and outcomes of uh, the DCC. Also the idea of uh, Andreas, where is Andreas? Uh, yeah, <laughs> of, um, which does not cost any money of creating this youth dialogues, each one on your own city and then connecting by, via video conference to have the youth like we did right now discussing about technology and the future in your city but also in the European context. That would be uh, you know, very well received by the society. This will make the youth of your cities feel more Europeans, feel more participating in the European making and that's already a big advantage. So Andreas will also submit to us a, a pager with his idea that we will submit to all of you for then linking and making this happen. By the way, I was reminded by many of you that you do not have the coordinates of each other. We are happy to disclose all the 40 cities with the different coordinates. I hope you agree with that, right? Okay, so homework uh, for the next day. Uh, then next events to pencil in your agenda. Our next academy will be on the 8th and 9th of April in Brussels this time, uh, less exotic. Uh, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then uh, the final conference, uh, it will be the 5th of June, again in Brussels. The final conference will be a major uh, how to say, celebration, I would consider that, 
of our achievements of the BCC that we achieved together and of course shaping together the, uh, the next phase. And yes, many of you asked us during uh, those two days what will happen to this DCC network after July, that as we know, this contract will end. So our intention is to keep this network alive as long as you wish to keep it alive. And uh, there will be a next phase, uh, which will take some time to, uh, because we have our internal bureaucratic procedures as well, we estimate to be able to have the new contract uh, by the end of this year uh, and then we will invite, of course, we will have a much more important budget, we will invite more cities to join in, but certainly you, the DCC cities, will be a, a pillar of this new action in order to allow you to continue, create more momentum, Co create more collaboration as you will be implementing your actions and follow through the implementation of these actions. The details we will be designing in the coming months, uh, but certainly we deserve a special place for uh, the DCC cities, of course those, no obligation, those that wish to continue and uh, implement with us our actions. Uh, with this, again, a big thanks to the city of Algeciras and the Chamber of Commerce who made this possible. Also, all the welcoming, uh, the warm welcome we had over those two days. And I would say also the unified political leadership that was demonstrated by four Spanish mayors coming together uh, those last two days, it was really a very, very positive example to be imitated. Uh, uh, as, as far as possible because uh, finally political leadership uh, is important to achieve our objectives, all of us. Otherwise it, it may risk to remain a paper exercise. When political leadership is there, more possibilities to go into the implementation. With this I would like to thank you very much. I uh, wish you a safe trip back home um, and see you then in Brussels in April. Thank you. Thank you.